Traveling back to the Yahiko period within the Akatsuki organization, Bayakuya initially sought to escape swiftly to avoid becoming a victim of the rise of pain. However, he unintentionally acquired a system bound to the Akatsuki organization. This system offered rewards as long as the Akatsuki organization grew and developed. To prevent the Akatsuki organization from being obliterated, Bayakuya had to take charge of guiding its development, steering it onto a completely different trajectory. When Hanzo and Danzo joined forces to crush the Akatsuki organization, they were astonished to discover its newfound strength, capable of challenging even the hidden rain village. Many years later, the five major ninja nations were taken aback to find that the Akatsuki organization had quietly subverted the entire ninja world, emerging as the uncrowned king of the shinobi realm. All of this was thanks to the man concealed deep within the Akatsuki organization. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni-sensei. Welcome to, What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Mastermind of Akatsuki? Part 1. If you enjoy this type of content, please gently pulverize the like button. Also, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Remember to check out the original story linked in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. Somewhere within the war-torn borders of the Land of Rain, nestled a humble village struggling to survive in the brutal world of Shinobi. A young boy, no older than a teenager, expertly twirled a kanai in his hand, his gaze fixed intently on the group of defeated rogue ninja sprawled before him. Just moments ago, he had led his team on a daring mission, thwarting the rogue ninja's raid and safeguarding the terrified villagers. Now, a new challenge presented itself, the fate of their captives. Sensing the boy's contemplative silence, one of his subordinates hesitantly approached. Lord Bayakuya, do you intend to kill of them like the others? Bayakuya's response was swift and decisive. With a flick of his wrist, the kanai shot forward, embedding itself deeply into the shoulder of a rogue ninja. The man convulsed in pain, his muffled screams echoing through the clearing. I question the villagers. Bayakuya spoke, his voice laced with a chilling certainty. These bandits have innocent blood staining their hand. They deserve nothing less than death. But Lord Yahiko, the subordinate countered, a flicker of doubt clouding his features, didn't he specifically instruct us to avoid unnecessary bloodshed? Perhaps these men could be swayed to our cause, become allies in our struggle. The mere mention of Yahiko's name caused Bayakuya's brow to fro. His voice dropped to a low growl. If outright execution is off the table, then we must ensure their demise appears accidental. A few casualties during the transport of these prisoners back to the base? A perfectly reasonable outcome, wouldn't you say? All for the greater good of Akatsuki's future. Faced with Bayakuya's unwavering resolve, the other ninjas exchanged nervous glances. While Yahiko held the official title of leader, it was Bayakuya who wielded the true power within Akatsuki. Entanglement in the brewing power struggle at the top was a dangerous game they were all too eager to avoid. Besides, a part of them, fueled by righteous anger, craved justice for the innocent lives these rogue ninja had so ruthlessly stolen. With a resigned nod, they heeded Bayakuya's grim command and began escorting the captives deeper into the concealing embrace of the forest. A few hours bled into dusk, painting the sky with streaks of orange and purple as Bayakuya and his team finally emerged from the village gate. The grateful villagers, their faces etched with relief, showered them with heartfelt thanks and warm farewells. During a well-deserved rest break beneath the shade of a towering oak, Bayakuya dug through the pockets of the fallen rogue ninja, a sly grin tugging at his lips as his fingers brushed against a wad of brightly colored bills. Bayakuya harbored a secret he held close to his chest. He wasn't a native of this war-torn world. Back in his previous life, Bayakuya had been a diligent cog in the corporate machine, tirelessly pouring his brainpower into his boss's demands by day and burning the midnight oil grinding away in mobile games by night. One fateful night, fueled by the ambition to climb the ranks and achieve the coveted super shadow status, 
He stayed up far past his bedtime. Then, darkness. When his vision sputtered back to life, he found himself amidst the chaos of the ninja world, reborn as an unremarkable ninja with no fancy bloodline to boast. Not only was he thrust into a world of violence without the privilege of a prestigious lineage, but fate had landed him smack dab in the middle of Akatsuki during Yahiko's idealistic reign. This fledgling organization, supposedly striving for world peace, had been teetering on the edge of absurdity since its inception. In anime, Yahiko, the first leader, was a bleeding-heart pacifist who believed Kambaya and understanding would magically usher in an era of tranquility. The second leader, Nagato, envisioned a more practical approach, nuclear deterrence, achieved by first casually wiping out a few billion people. And then there was Abito, who took the cake with his outrageous plan to trap everyone in a virtual dream world, essentially turning the ninja clans into a buffet for some parasitic alien clan called the Atsutsuki. Talk about swinging from one extreme to another. However, these were all worries for the future. In its current form, Akatsuki was more of a struggling grassroots organization than a world-dominating force. Aside from taking on the occasional odd job from various villages, their biggest hurdle was a crippling financial crisis. Yahiko's unwavering commitment to peace meant avoiding missions that reeked of bloodshed or warmongering. Instead, Akatsuki found themselves relegated to tamer tasks like fending off bandits or tilling field. Yahiko's occasional bouts of charity didn't exactly help matters, leaving the organization perpetually teetering on the brink of financial ruin. While his comrades readily pledged their loyalty to the cause, the harsh reality was that weapons, medicine, and other necessities didn't magically materialize. Maintaining a functioning organization required a steady stream of funds, something Akatsuki desperately lacked. So, Bayakuya, with a heavy heart, devised a covert operation. Target rogue ninjas, loot their valuables, and use the black market to plug the financial holes while simultaneously keeping the villagers safe. A tired sigh escaped Bayakuya's lips. The irony was thick enough to cut with a kanai. Back in his old life, he slaved away to buy his boss fancy cars and houses, and now, in this new reality, he was still stuck in a cycle of work, albeit for a ragtag group of ninja. Was there any point to this whole ice sky experience? Maybe jumping ship and joining another village was the answer? But the thought of venturing out into the war-torn world sent shivers down his spine. With his current skill set, leaving the relative safety of the Land of Rain's novice village would be a death sentence. Nagato, with his powerful Rinnegan, was the only anchor keeping him grounded in this chaotic world. Just as Bayakuya was contemplating the merits of strategic job hopping to secure a better position and a raise, a jarring electronic voice echoed directly in his mind. Simultaneously, a semi-transparent panel materialized before his eyes, its luminescence cutting through the fading twilight. System prompt. You are now bound to Akatsuki. The state of Akatsuki will be linked to your body. Enhancing the organization's strength will earn you corresponding rewards. If the last member of the organization dies, you will die as well. Current Akatsuki rating. An unknown small organization. It may become famous in the future, but few people know about it now. It is recommended to quickly enhance the organization's strength. Ubayakuya's eyes darted between the swirling information on the panel and the surrounding world, momentarily forgetting the ache in his muscles. He meticulously examined the floating interface, noticing not just the development panel but also a personal panel showcasing his stats and a tantalizing newbie gift pack waiting to be claimed. Name, Bayakuya Age, 12 Current Bound Organization, Akatsuki Chakra Attributes, Water, Wind, Yang Ninjutsu. Three basic techniques, basic kunai throwing technique, wind release. Great breakthrough, kekiai genkai. None. Personal evaluation. Chunin level, capable of crushing ordinary ninjas but with little chance of escaping when facing true strong opponents. He brushed aside the personal evaluation, focusing instead on the implications of this unexpected development. After a thorough inspection, Bayakuya dismissed the possibility of a genjutsu prank. A surge of excitement coursed through him, tempered by a healthy dose of caution. The system, as it presented itself, tethered him to Akatsuki's fate. While it didn't appear to directly endanger his life, remaining within the organization inherently carried risk. However, this unexpected twist slammed the door shut on his job-hopping fantasies. Bayakuya, 
now presented with a system and a purpose intricately woven with Akatsuki's rise, was forced to reevaluate his path forward. The path of a rogue ninja, while offering a modicum of freedom, no longer held the same appeal. Fortunately, a flicker of hope ignited within Bayakuya as he noticed the consolation prize, a newbie gift pack offered by the enigmatic system. With a tentative tap on the virtual box, the electronic voice once again filled the air. System prompt, you have obtained the Uzumaki bloodline, partial. The system prompt, you have obtained water release. Wild water wave, the system prompt, you have obtained paper release. Basic, a surge of warmth, like a tidal wave of chakra, coursed through Bayakuya's body the moment he received the rewards. Almost instantly, he felt a surge of renewed energy. Not only did his chakra condense at an accelerated rate, but his senses sharpened, expanding his perception range considerably. Curiosity peaked, Bayakuya wandered away from the group. Rolling up his sleeve, he drew his kunai across his arm, leaving a shallow cut. Blood welled from the wound, but then, in a mesmerizing display, began healing at a visible pace. Within moments, only a faint white scar remained, which itself vanished before his eyes. A satisfied smile tugged at Bayakuya's lips as he lowered his sleeve. The Uzumaki bloodline's regenerative properties were undeniable. Even in its partial state, his healing factor surpassed his previous capabilities by a staggering margin. However, a healthy dose of perspective kept his excitement in check. Compared to the likes of Nagato, who wielded the legendary Rinnegan, Karen, a living medical pouch, and Naruto, who defied death itself, his regeneration paled in comparison. It was a partial inheritance in every sense of the word. Pushing those thoughts aside, Bayakuya turned his attention to the remaining rewards. Paper release. Basic and water release. Wild Water Wave were, on the surface, fairly common ninjutsu. The intriguing distinction, however, lay in their origin. Paper Release Basic belonged to Conan, while Water Release. Wild Water Wave was Yahiko's signature technique. It seemed, by a twist of fate, Bayakuya had inherited a piece of each member of Yahiko's trio. Perhaps those deemed weak by the system simply didn't leave behind any looted rewards, after all, with the exception of Yahiko's potential jonin level prowess, the rest of Akatsuki were likely Chunin at best, a fact that likely influenced their decision to join the organization in the first place. Regardless, the system's generosity, particularly the bestowing of a Kekiai Genkai right off the bat, couldn't be denied. With this newfound power and the system's guidance, a sliver of hope bloomed within Bayakuya. Perhaps, one day, he might even stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the prophesied child of prophecy, or even reach the dizzying heights of a Kagaya Atsutsuki. The future, once shrouded in uncertainty, now shimmered with exciting possibilities. The icy rain drumming a relentless rhythm on the leaves snapped Bayakuya out of his ambitious daydream. Reality, a harsh mistress, reminded him of his current predicament. He was a nobody in the grand scheme of things, lacking the power or reputation to even dream of challenging the elite. Akage, a leader of a hidden village, was leagues beyond him. Even facing an elite jonin, a highly skilled special forces ninja, could prove fatal. No, his immediate concern was survival, not godhood. He, Bayakuya, needed a plan, a way to not only strengthen himself but also elevate Akatsuki from its current obscurity. Only by forging Akatsuki into a force to be reckoned with could he avoid the tragic fate that awaited him as a mere pawn in Pain's twisted game. With this resolve crystallized within him, Bayakuya cast a determined gaze upon his comrades. Back at their base, Bayakuya instructed his team to report the successful completion of their mission. He, however, had a different destination in mind. Unlike the seamless integration of the Uzumaki bloodline, the water release, Wild Water Wave and Paper Release. Basic techniques, though system rewards as well, still required dedicated practice. One might question why he wouldn't prioritize strengthening Akatsuki directly. After all, a flourishing Akatsuki would translate to his own growth. But the truth was, without demonstrable strength of his own, Yahiko wouldn't even consider his suggestions. Their constant clashes during organizational meetings were an open secret within Akatsuki. Bayakuya bristled at Yahiko's idealistic naivety, while Yahiko saw Bayakuya's methods as too ruthless, a stark contrast to Akatsuki's core principles. The Akatsuki training ground was a testament to their shoestring budget. 
a flat, open area with a few scattered targets served as their training facility, with the promise of more equipment forever on the to-buy list. Nevertheless, for Bayakuya honing his ninjutsu, it sufficed. He began with Yahiko's signature jutsu, the water release. Wild water wave. Sitting cross-legged, he meticulously refined his chakra and weaved the hand seals. As his chakra surged, a current of water gathered from the ground, coalescing into a powerful wave. With a final push, he directed the wave to crash against the target. Predictably, it missed. Bayakuya wasn't delusional enough to believe he'd master a jutsu after a single attempt. He wasn't Uchiha Itachi, the prodigy who could replicate a jutsu just by witnessing it once, but perseverance was his weapon. He practiced relentlessly, refining his control over the water wave. Soon, he wasn't just hitting the target, he was manipulating the wave's trajectory, directing it around the target to slam into the rock behind it. The system's jutsu reward proved invaluable. It bypassed countless hours of arduous training, accelerating his learning curve. Another benefit, his chakra reserves. Before the Uzumaki bloodline, a single jutsu or two would leave him drained. Now, after unleashing ten consecutive wild water waves, he still felt energized. This was the true power of the Uzumaki lineage. Not quite a Kekiai Genkai, but an advantage far more potent. Having conquered the appetizer, Bayakuya turned his focus to the main course, Conan's paper release. Basic. This singular jutsu held immense potential. Years down the line, Conan would utilize it to achieve Kaga level power. While he only possessed the foundational technique, its potential for growth was undeniable. At the very least, it promised him a never-ending supply of paper weapons, eliminating the need to constantly purchase kunai and shuriken. But the true power of paper release lay far beyond mere utility. Wiping sweat from his brow after a successful session with the water release, Bayakuya took a moment to catch his breath. Now came the real challenge, Conan's paper release. Basic. Unlike the water release, which thrived on raw power and control, paper release demanded a different kind of finesse. He started simple, focusing on shaping the paper into basic ninja tools, kunai and shuriken. With a flick of his wrist and precise chakra manipulation, paper morphed into deadly projectiles. A satisfied smirk played on his lips as he sent them flying towards the targets. A sharp whistle filled the air, a chilling melody that promised destruction. But then, disaster struck. Just before the paper weapons found their mark, a relentless torrent of rain drenched them. The once-proud shuriken crumpled into a soggy mess, falling to the ground with a pathetic plop. The weakness was undeniable water, paper's natural nemesis. Even this ordinary rain could wreak havoc, and a direct water release attack could spell certain doom. Bayakuya, however, wasn't one to be easily discouraged. He harbored a secret weapon, a knowledge of the future. He recalled snippets from his past life, memories of Conan utilizing a special oil coating to protect her paper creations from water damage. A sly grin stretched across his face. In the grand scheme of things, most jutsu battles boiled down to two key factors, timing and chakra reserve. Disrupting an opponent's timing with a well-placed, waterproof paper weapon could be just the edge he needed. With renewed purpose, Bayakuya set to work. He meticulously experimented with various oils, searching for the perfect balance between waterproofing and paper integrity. Hours bled into dusk, the rhythmic drumming of rain providing a constant soundtrack to his tireless efforts. Finally, a breakthrough. He discovered a formula that effectively repelled water while maintaining the structural integrity of the paper. A triumphant laugh escaped his lips. The key to overcoming paper releases Achilles' heel. But Bayakuya's ambitions soared beyond mere waterproofing. He envisioned an even grander application, explosive tags. Imagine the possibilities. A seemingly endless supply of explosive tags, handcrafted from readily available paper, could revolutionize Akatsuki's firepower. Not only would it address their financial woes by minimizing the need for expensive store-bought explosives, but it would also instill fear in their enemies. The mere mention of Akatsuki's paper bombs would send shivers down their spines. As Bayakuya meticulously perfected his waterproof paper shuriken, a scroll bearing his signature materialized in Yahiko's office. Unfurling it, Yahiko's brow furrowed in a mixture of anger and begrudging acceptance. Bayakuya's report was as blunt as ever, stating the captives had died en route due to bad weather. 
The blatant disregard for Yahiko's ideals was infuriating, the flimsy excuse a slap in the face. However, amidst the annoyance, a sliver of practicality flickered. The report also detailed the mission's financial gains, a much-needed boost for Akatsuki's perpetually empty coffers. Yahiko sighed, acknowledging the ever-present dilemma Bayakuya presented. Their ideologies clashed like thunder and lightning, Bayakuya's pragmatism a stark contrast to Yahiko's unwavering belief in peace. Yet, Yahiko couldn't deny Bayakuya's effectiveness. He entrusted him with critical missions, a testament to his competence despite their internal rivalry. Just then, the office door creaked open, revealing Conan, her brow etched with concern. Has Bayakuya returned? Another disagreement? Yahiko offered a tired smile, shaking his head as he pushed the report towards her. He spared me the pleasure of his company this time, but his methods still managed to rile me up. Conan skimmed the report, a wry smile playing on her lips. Bayakuya may lack tact, but his results are undeniable. He resolved the crisis in Area 11 and brought back a hefty sum. A tense silence settled between them. Conan understood the ideological chasm separating Yahiko and Bayakuya. Their clashes during meetings were a well-worn record. However, a deeper truth resonated within her of both men, in their own unorthodox ways, desired a brighter future for Akatsuki. Yahiko, his gaze distant, broke the silence. You mentioned the supply shortage a few days ago, right? That's why you're here. Conan offered a small nod. The base's medical supplies were running critically low. Yahiko, rummaging through a drawer, produced a meager sum of cash. Find Bayakuya. He should be near the base, maybe in training. Take him with you to procure supplies. Though harboring reservations, Conan assented, retrieving the funds and departing the office. Conan's search for Bayakuya led her to the training grounds, where he was engaged in a rigorous taijutsu session. Despite the burgeoning potential of paper release, Bayakuya understood the fundamental importance of taijutsu. In the crucible of real combat, ninjutsu's effectiveness could be hampered by unforeseen circumstances, but taijutsu remained a constant, reliable tool. Even clashes between Kage, the pinnacle of ninja power, often devolved into taijutsu brawls. Of course, there was another, more pragmatic reason for his focus. He'd noticed Conan's arrival and deliberately switched from paper release to taijutsu. Whether copying techniques was a forbidden practice within Akatsuki remained unclear, but Bayakuya wasn't eager to unveil his newfound mastery of paper release to Conan. After all, if they were to utilize the same technique, the less skilled party would suffer the inevitable embarrassment. Coming to a halt, Bayakuya pivoted towards the blue-haired Kunoichi leaning against a nearby tree. At 14, Conan was a far cry from the formidable woman Bayakuya remembered from his previous life. Clad in her Akatsuki uniform, she exuded an air of innocence, a far cry to the ominous black robe with crimson clouds she would one day wear. Conan, in turn, studied Bayakuya. He appeared younger than her, his clothes spotless, almost blindingly white. His eyes, however, held a maturity that belied his age, hinting at a past laden with hardship. Respectful of the unspoken code of silence around past experiences within Akatsuki, Conan refrained from prying. A beat of silence hung heavy in the air before Bayakuya spoke, his voice devoid of emotion. Conan Senpai, did Yahiko send you with a task for me? Conan offered a curt nod, then a hesitant shake of her head. Yahiko wasn't particularly forthcoming, but there is indeed a matter requiring your assistance. Our supplies are dwindling, and I was hoping you might accompany me on a procurement mission to the village. Bayakuya's lips curved into a knowing smile. This must be Yahiko's doing, isn't it? Before Conan could respond, Bayakuya gleaned the answer from her conflicted countenance, offering a smile as he nodded. All right, I'll come along. It always amuses me to see Yahiko's conflicted expression, fuming over my methods yet relying on me nonetheless. Conan's brow furrowed in confusion. This dynamic between Bayakuya and Yahiko, when did it develop? Why were she and Nagato oblivious to it? Despite the swirling questions in her mind, Conan held back. Social interactions weren't her forte. In fact, outside of Yahiko and Nagato, her conversations were typically brief and to the point. The night had fallen thick and heavy by the time they reached the border. With the sun dipped below the horizon, shadows stretched long and menacing, a chilling reminder of the precariousness of their situation. 
to blend in and avoid attracting unwanted attention, especially given Hanzo's waning influence, Bayakuya and Conan had discreetly removed their rain village headbands. Huddled around a crackling fire they'd built in a hidden cave, the warmth offered little respite from the biting wind that whipped through the desolate landscape. The savory scent of grilled fish wafted through the air, momentarily distracting Conan from the ever-present tension. Despite their contrasting personalities, Conan was beginning to understand the depth of Yahiko's trust in Bayakuya. It wasn't just his competence in completing missions, but a quiet dependability that resonated beneath his gruff exterior. From meticulously planned routes to ensuring they had a safe place to rest, Bayakuya approached everything with a calculated efficiency. However, this newfound respect was tinged with a sliver of unease. Bayakuya's paranoia, a constant low hum beneath the surface, manifested in his hypervigilance towards even the most ordinary passers-by. It felt like a coiled spring, perpetually on the verge of snapping. What horrors, Conan wondered, had Bayakuya witnessed before finding solace within Akatsuki's ranks. Their meal of grilled fish and rice balls finished, Bayakuya sat in solemn silence, his gaze fixed on the rain-streaked canvas of the night sky. The rhythmic patter of raindrops against the leaves added a melancholic touch to the scene. Conan followed his line of sight, a frown etching itself onto her brow. Suddenly, the quiet night was shattered by the ominous whine of arrows tearing through the air. Sparks erupted as they found their mark, scattering the embers of their campfire. A group of hulking figures, clad in raincoats and exuding a menacing aura, materialized at the cave entrance. Conan's blue eyes narrowed, her hand instinctively reaching for the paper tags strapped to her thigh. These weren't mere bandits. Yeah, their bloodlust was unmistakable. The leader, a man with a cruel scar marring his face, surveyed them with a predatory glint in his eyes. Seeing the absence of headbands, a cruel smirk twisted his lips. Camping out in the wilderness isn't exactly the wisest choice, especially in these borderlands. Now, hand over your valuables, and maybe we'll let you live. A little longer, the audacity of their threat, demanding not just their possessions but their very lives, sent a surge of anger coursing through Conan. Fear wasn't an emotion she entertained easily, but the casual cruelty of these men chilled her. Bayakuya, on the other hand, seemed to shrink back behind Conan, his expression feigning terror. However, a flicker of something akin to amusement danced in his eyes, unseen by the approaching rogues. This unexpected turn of events wasn't a setback, it was an opportunity, a chance to deliver a harsh but necessary lesson to Conan. He had deliberately chosen a risky campsite, a gamble that had paid off. These rogue ninjas were the unsuspecting prey, caught in the web he'd carefully spun. While Bayakuya formulated his next move, Conan decided to take matters into her own hands. With a deft manipulation of her chakra, she conjured a flurry of paper shuriken, which swirled around her like a deadly storm before hurtling towards the rogue leader, stopping mere inches from his face. A silent warning, a plea to stand down before things escalated further. Stand down. Another step, and I won't hesitate to kill you all. You're ninjas yourselves. The leader scoffed, his bravado momentarily shaken by the display of power. But the sight of a young girl wielding such a jutsu reignited his malice. With a snarl, he lunged forward, a kunai glinting in his hand. Before he could even complete the hand seals for his intended jutsu, a blur of white sent the kunai flying. A second later, a kunai of its own pierced his chest, silencing his murderous intent forever. The remaining rogues gaped at their fallen leader, their bloodlust momentarily replaced by sheer bewilderment. Seizing the moment, Bayakuya stepped forward, his eyes cold and calculating. Looks like your little leader forgot one important rule. Never underestimate your opponent. Bayakuya, a picture of cold efficiency, plucked the crimson-stained kunai from the rogue leader's chest. His gaze, devoid of warmth, locked onto the remaining ninjas, particularly lingering on the nervous archer who instinctively recoiled. The tension crackled in the air, thick enough to choke on. Unable to bear Bayakuya's chilling stare any longer, the archer, his bravado replaced by raw fear, drew his bow and unleashed an arrow. It flew with deadly speed, almost invisible to the naked eye, but Bayakuya was ready. A surge of chakra erupted from him, conjuring a wall of water that rose with surprising speed to meet the projectile, deflecting it harmlessly. The rogue ninjas, momentarily stunned by the display of power, 
found themselves facing a tidal wave of destruction. Bayakuya, with a flick of his wrist, channeled a massive wave, the size of a house, that crashed down upon them with terrifying force. The shock wave sent them reeling, scattering their formation and making it difficult to maintain their footing. Bayakuya, capitalizing on their disarray, launched a relentless barrage of shuriken, each finding its mark with deadly precision. One by one, the rogue ninjas fell, their anguished cries swallowed by the symphony of death. Panic seized the remaining rogues. The once confident warriors now resembled cornered rats, their eyes wide with terror as they witnessed their comrades dispatched with ruthless efficiency. Bayakuya, a blur of white in the night, hunted them down with unnerving calmness. He moved with a predator's grace, eliminating any who dared to resist. However, just as the last rogue ninja seemed on the verge of receiving his final judgment, Bayakuya called off the attack. To the other's confusion, he allowed the remaining ones to escape, their ragged figures disappearing into the darkness. Conan, her cheeks flushed with adrenaline but her voice laced with curiosity, approached Bayakuya. Why did you let them go? Didn't you say you eliminate all threats? Bayakuya nodded subtly before elaborating, I deliberately let them go. They're not typical rogue ninjas. There's likely a mastermind orchestrating their actions. Rogue ninjas in the shinobi world typically comprise missing nin or ex-shinobi from minor villages that have been displaced. Additionally, there exists a distinct class of rogue ninjas, ordinary individuals who have learned to harness chakra. These rogue ninjas possess the ability to enhance their bodies and weapons with chakra but lack proficiency in other areas. Most of the rogue ninjas they had encountered fell into this category, lacking even the basic skills like the three basic techniques, tree climbing or water walking. Their capabilities were inferior to those of academy graduates, limited to preying on ordinary civilians. However, the discrepancy in strength between these rogue ninjas and their leader was perplexing. The leader exhibited skills akin to a chunin-level shinobi, displaying decisive judgment in confronting formidable adversaries, qualities uncharacteristic of a typical rogue ninja. The leader seemed more akin to a shinobi trained by a major village. Bayakuya, aren't you being too paranoid? Conan countered, her voice laced with doubt. After all, Bayakuya's instincts had proven unfailing ever since she had known him. Even Yahiko, despite their ideological clashes, held unwavering trust in his judgment. After a moment's pause, Conan inquired, What is our next course of action? We shall attend to the bodies of these rogue ninjas and then track those who fled. We must ascertain their mastermind and acquaint you with the realities of the shinobi world. The latter part of his statement, Bayakuya kept to himself. Conan nodded in understanding, proceeding to follow Bayakuya's directives to dispose of the rogue ninjas' bodies, primarily by obliterating their brains to prevent any potential extraction of information about them. Bayakuya's meticulous and professional handling of the situation only deepened Conan's confusion. This boy, barely out of his teens, seemed to possess an uncanny amount of experience. Was there truly such a thing as a prodigy ninja, born with the instincts and knowledge honed by years of combat? Conan felt the weight of Bayakuya's gaze on her and stifled a surprised gasp. A silent chuckle rumbled through Bayakuya's chest. He took point, his senses attuned to the rogue ninja's chakra signatures as he leaped effortlessly from branch to branch. He, too, was consumed by a burning curiosity about the faction pulling the strings of these rogue ninjas operating so close to the border. Despite her reservations, Conan pushed herself to keep pace with Bayakuya's swift movements. They followed the rogue ninjas until the first rays of dawn began to paint the horizon with streaks of orange and gold. Finally, they stopped upon a large, sturdy tree that offered a good vantage point. Using binoculars, they meticulously scrutinized the situation, unfolding at the rogue ninja's base. A grim realization dawned on Conan as she watched the rogue ninjas enter the base. Shortly after, a dozen shinobi emerged, their headbands emblazoned with the symbol of the grass village. A tremor ran through her body, a mixture of shock and disbelief. Here was concrete evidence. Rogue ninjas operating within the Land of Rain, secretly backed by the Grass Village. The rogue ninjas are being supported by the Grass Village, Conan exclaimed, her body trembling slightly with shock. She was taken aback by the revelation that some of the rogue ninjas operating within the Land of Rain were covertly backed by the Grass Village. It's not as straightforward as it seems. What you perceive with your eyes may not always reflect the truth, 
Bayakuya remarked, his expression serious as he crouched on the tree trunk, meticulously reflecting on the unfolding events. Just because the Shinobi wore grass village headbands didn't automatically make them loyal to the village itself. Bayakuya's reasoning was simple. The grass village, currently embroiled in a bloody conflict between two major powers, wouldn't have the resources to blatantly provoke the land of rain, especially with the notoriously ruthless Hanzo the salamander holding the reins. Openly antagonizing the rain would only serve to drag them into the war, further escalating the already volatile situation. The potential fallout would be disastrous, with the grass village's territory becoming a chaotic four-way battleground. Furthermore, the rogue ninja leader's fighting style gave him away. His earth jutsu techniques were far more characteristic of the stone village, known for their mastery over earth release. The stone village had a far greater motive to muddy the waters of this battlefield compared to the grass village. Their geographical proximity and long-standing rivalry with the land of rain made them the more likely culprit. Of course, the hidden leaf village couldn't be entirely discounted. Danzo, the enigmatic leader of the route, was a man who operated in the shadows and shouldn't be underestimated. Bayakuya concluded that they had gleaned enough intel for now. Pressing further held unnecessary risk. They lacked a compelling reason, nor the manpower, to completely unravel the identities of these rogue ninjas. With Hanzo the Salamander keeping a watchful eye, no major shinobi village dared to outright provoke the Land of Rain. Even conquering this war-torn nation wouldn't be much of a prize. The cost of subjugating and holding such a territory would be crippling, a truth that held water even for the Leaf Village at its zenith. Beyond the potential for plunder, Bayakuya's primary objective in bringing Conan here was to expose her to the brutal realities of the ninja world. The harsh environment of the Land of Rain had fostered a generation of naive shinobi. Sheltered under Hanzo's leadership, many had grown complacent, mistakenly believing their lack of conflict stemmed from their inherent strength rather than their strategic insignificance. We've gathered what we need, Bayakuya said to Conan, gesturing for her to follow. He was about to propel himself down from the tree and retreat from the brewing conflict when Conan, still glued to the binoculars, hissed, Bayakuya, the enemy base is under attack, and there are a lot of ninjas heading our way, Bayakuya's brow furrowed. He tapped into his Uzumaki clan's sensory prowess to gauge the approaching ninjas. Their swift movements indicated they were at least Chunin level. In a swift motion, Bayakuya retrieved a vial of specialized oil from his pack. Beneath Conan's quizzical stare, he elucidated, Morning dew can easily saturate ordinary paper, but oiled paper offers greater resistance to moisture. Prepare for combat as we withdraw. Our pursuers are seasoned shinobi. Conan accepted the oil without question, her mind already shifting into battle mode. However, a nagging curiosity lingered. How did Bayakuya no paper release techniques were vulnerable to water? She herself had only uncovered this weakness the night before. Was it possible they had reached this conclusion simultaneously? The gravity of their situation, however, took precedence. With practiced efficiency, they coated their paper weapons in the oil, readying themselves for the inevitable confrontation. The approaching elite enemy ninjas signaled a fight for survival, a test that demanded their utmost focus and skill. Bayakuya tossed the special oil to Conan, his voice low and instructional as he briefed her on its use. His mind, however, raced ahead, strategizing the next move in their clandestine dance. Within his sensory range, figures blurred past, their trajectory a panicked retreat rather than a purposeful approach. Grass ninjas, Bayakuya noted, fleeing with a desperate urgency that spoke volumes. Who or what could inspire such abject terror? Famed Jonin from Iwagakure or Kanahagakure, perhaps even a Kage themselves? Bayakuya couldn't be certain, but these fleeing figures were now their adversaries. Identity could wait. Eliminating the immediate threat was paramount. Patience, always a virtue Bayakuya possessed in abundance, served him well. After a tense wait, four grass ninjas materialized from the foliage. Three Chunin, one Tokabetsu Jonin. Bayakuya murmured to Conan, his voice barely a whisper as his keen senses unraveled their chakra signatures. A kanai, launched with deadly precision, arced through the air, embedding itself deep into the branch where a grass ninja was about to land. A flurry of shuriken followed, a whirlwind of steel aimed to cripple and contain. One grass ninja, caught midair, was struck by the shuriken, 
a pained grunt escaping their lips as they were forced to scramble for a less than graceful landing. Seizing the opportune moment, Conan unleashed her own barrage. Paper Shuriken, imbued with deadly purpose, swarmed another grass ninja, engulfing them in a fluttering storm that rendered them immobile. Nicely done, Conan Senpai finally got the kill. Bayakuya commended Conan before refocusing on the remaining grass ninjas. Although the outcome deviated slightly from his expectations, incapacitating a quarter of the enemy's forces in the initial surprise attack was commendable. Of the remaining three grass ninjas, one clutched at their side, the toxin from Bayakuya's kunai already working its insidious magic. Their death, it seemed, was a matter of time. A tense silence descended, broken only by the ragged gasps of the poisoned ninja. Bayakuya and Conan, poised for another coordinated attack, unleashed a torrent of kunai and shuriken. But their carefully crafted plan was thrown into disarray as the grass ninja captain, with a surge of earth chakra, slammed his fist into the ground. The earth rumbled in response, a series of hardened rock layers rising from the ground like a defiant shield, effectively blocking the incoming barrage. Grass ninjas? Nope. These were rock ninjas, cleverly disguised, their mission shrouded in deception. Bayakuya pondered silently, then called Conan, Conan Senpai, you go deal with the Chunins. I'll handle their captain. Despite a flicker of apprehension, the first pangs of taking a life, Conan obeyed instinctively, her movements fluid as she darted towards the enemy. In the face of mounting danger, her trust in Bayakuya solidified. Bayakuya locked eyes with the rock ninja captain, his voice laced with cool amusement. Should I address you as grass ninja or perhaps rock ninja? The exposed imposter scowled. Who are you? Kanoha scum? Bayakuya's lips curved into a faint smirk. Not at all. I am from Amage Cure. Then why are you stopping us? Suppressing his anger, the rock ninja captain knew he couldn't engage in conflict with the opponent. If they were delayed, the terrifying ninja from Kanoha would catch up soon. You appeared in the territory of Amage Cure. So naturally, we have to stop you. The rock ninja captain scoffed, his facade crumbling. Engaging in open conflict was unwise. We strayed unknowingly. We'll leave immediately. Bayakuya ignored the blatant lie, weaving hand signs with practiced ease. A torrent of paper erupted from his clothes, transforming into razor-sharp shuriken that whistled towards the captain. Following with another set of hand seals, Bayakuya unleashed his jutsu, amplifying the shuriken's lethality. Wind release. Great breakthrough. The rock ninja captain, realizing the imminent attack, mirrored Bayakuya's hand movements in a desperate attempt to defend himself. A wall of earth rose from the ground with a resounding boom, just barely deflecting the barrage of empowered shuriken. Taking cover behind the hastily erected earthen flow wall, the captain bellowed, Amage Cure Ninja, are you deliberately inciting a war between our nations? We merely made a navigational error. We'll depart at once. Bayakuya remained unfazed. He molded chakra, spitting out a torrent of water that engulfed the earthen flow wall with a hiss. The rushing water masked the sound of paper sheets detaching from his form, bypassing the wall and completely enveloping the rock ninja captain. Panicked, the captain fumbled for a kunai, intending to sever the paper bindings. But it was a futile effort. Concealed within them were explosive tags, detonating in a blinding flash. The deafening blasts startled the forest into a symphony of squawking birds. Smoke from the explosion cleared, revealing the rock ninja captain, his once proud stance reduced to a crumpled form. Soot covered and disarmed. He glared at Bayakuya with a smoldering resentment. Bayakuya, ever cautious, didn't approach recklessly. He finished the incapacitated opponent with a swift kunai strike. Examining the body, he found a jonin vest and the insignia of a wagakure, concrete proof of the imposter's true identity. A disbelieving thought flickered across Bayakuya's mind. Had he truly eliminated a jonin level opponent? He scoffed at the notion. A casual takedown of such a formidable foe was inconceivable. The success of this encounter hinged on a confluence of factors. The element of surprise, the rock ninja's fear, and the resulting loss of will to fight. These, combined with his own skills, culminated in the unexpected demise of the Iwagakure Jonin. However, the opponent might only be a special Jonin from Iwagakure, not a true Jonin. Moreover, the crisis facing him and Conan had not been completely resolved. 
They had only taken out the fleeing Iwagakure ninja team, but the ninja who forced the Iwagakure team to flee was the true monster. At this moment, Conan, who had been pursuing another Iwagakure ninja, returned to the original location. Having overcome her psychological barriers, a chunin level Iwagakure ninja could not possibly be Conan's match. After three years of training under Jiraiya, the three-man team actually had the strength close to that of Jonin. However, due to their reluctance to kill, they were overly conservative in their actions, leading to an inability to fully utilize their strength. Conan glanced at the fallen rock ninja captain on the ground and was about to say something when she noticed the paper pieces next to Bayakuya, deepening her confusion. She didn't remember using ninjutsu here. Perhaps the intense battle just now caused her to forget. Not dwelling on it, Conan approached Bayakuya and looked at him with concern. Bayakuya, are you injured? Bayakuya shook his head and picked up the spoils with the Iwagakure insignia. Conan Senpai, these people aren't ninjas from Kuzagakure but rock ninjas disguised as grass ninjas, probably trying to provoke a war between the land of rain and the land of grass. Conan felt like her brain wasn't functioning properly. They were supposed to chase down a group of rogue ninjas, right? How come the identity of these rogue ninjas keeps changing? They were disguised as grass ninjas just now, and now they're disguised as rock ninjas? The ninja world seemed even more complex than she had imagined. She couldn't even distinguish who the enemies were. But if she, as a ninja from Amage Cure, mistakenly reported them as grass ninjas, it might indeed spark a conflict between the land of rain and the land of grass. Bayakuya noticed Conan's expression. He wanted to reassure her, but what Conan needed was a lasting impression. Conan Senpai, it's not just about disguising as ninjas from other countries. Even the villagers could be enemy imposters. In this chaotic world, we can't let our guard down, not even against anyone, including our comrades. That's the cruel world of Shinobi. As Bayakuya and Conan lurked in ambush within the rock hideout, a leaf shinobi team was hot on the enemy's trail. Their Jounin leader spearheaded the assault on the enemy's stronghold, their mission critical, to sever the enemy's communication lines. However, for the silver-haired youth at the team's helm, it felt more like a chance for their Jounin sensei to provide them with battlefield experience. More precisely, it was an opportunity thrust upon him, burdened by two teammates he viewed as liabilities. Having recently earned his Jounin rank, he'd already weathered countless battles. He didn't need this trial by fire to grasp the war's brutality. Hey Kakashi, why the constant deadpan expression? We're on a mission, remember? Abito, the black-haired youth sporting goggles, barked at Kakashi's indifferent demeanor, a flicker of annoyance igniting within him. Kakashi barely registered Abito's thought. He darted to a nearby tree, scrutinizing the footprints below. Finishing the mission swiftly was his sole focus. Kakashi's attitude really grinds my gears. One of these days, I'll make him pay, Abito grumbled, folding his arms across his chest and glaring at Kakashi's retreating form. Rin, the brown-haired girl beside him, offered a helpless smile and patted Abito's shoulder in consolation. Hold on, Abito. You know Kakashi. He's been in a dark place lately. Even so, I can't stomach his aloofness. How can the mission possibly outweigh our comrades' well-being? Abito's voice softened slightly, but the embers of resentment towards Kakashi still smoldered. Feeling a surge of indignation, he quickened his pace to match Kakashi's, both of them examining the enemy's escape route. Suddenly, a deafening explosion ripped through the distance. The explosion ignited a spark in Abito's eyes. Without hesitation, he bolted through the forest, drawn towards the source of the blast. Seeing Abito's impulsive charge, Rin scrambled to follow him, while Kakashi, trailing not far behind, let out a resigned sigh but nonetheless pushed forward. Minato's squad was the only one willing to take him on anymore. Ostracized by the others, Abito was a constant source of frustration. Abito's movements were a blur of speed, and within moments, he had reached the supposed battle zone. Large trees, scarred and splintered by jutsu clashes, surrounded him. His gaze darted around frantically, searching for any sign of the enemy. Just as Abito was about to launch himself down from the branch, a voice cut through the air, sharp and laced with warning. Hold it right there. The path ahead is littered with explosive tags I planted. Unless you have a death wish, I suggest you reconsider. Abito reacted instinctively, leaping backward with a startled yelp. 
A kunai, snatched from his pouch in a practiced motion, flew forward, just in time to deflect a detonation charm that erupted in a blinding flash. The shockwave from the blast sent a wave of icy sweat cascading down Abito's back. He cautiously turned his gaze towards the source of the voice, his apprehension solidifying into recognition at the sight of the two figures emerging from the smoke. Bayakuya and Conan. After neutralizing the IWA Nin squad, Bayakuya had picked up on the presence of Kakashi's team. Even before Abito's reckless charge, Bayakuya had spotted Kakashi perched on a treetop. The silver hair, the ever-present mask, and the unmistakable Kanahigakure headband, it was unmistakable. Kakashi Hataki. This Kakashi, a prodigy even in his youth, possessed skills that rivaled any Jounin. He was a force to be reckoned with, one of Kanoha's most promising talents. With Kakashi's identity confirmed, the other young ninjas became clear as well. Abito Uchiha, the very same who would one day lay waste to the entire Akatsuki organization while the Sanin were away on a mission, Abito Uchiha, also known as Tobi. The thought of eliminating Abito right here, severing the future threat he posed to Akatsuki, flickered across Bayakuya's mind. But after a moment of cool consideration, he opted for a different approach. Taking out Abito was certainly an option, but even his demise wouldn't guarantee complete eradication of the problem. Nagato and Conan were still very much in the picture. Besides, with Kakashi by Abito's side, a reckless move was almost guaranteed to backfire spectacularly. More importantly, there was no way Kakashi and Abito would simply allow the IWA Nin to waltz away from their mission. During the Third Great Ninja War, the only ninja who could force Iwagakure to abandon a mission was the future fourth Hokage, the legendary Yellow Flash, Minato Namikaze. Identify yourselves, Bayakuya demanded cautiously. Abito, ever the impulsive one, bristled at being ignored and opened his mouth to speak. But Kakashi, ever the strategist, cut him off with a placating hand. We are Kanahagakure Shinobi, Kakashi began, his voice measured and polite. We recently dismantled an Iwagakure base in the Land of Grass. In our pursuit, we may have inadvertently crossed into the Land of Rain. We have no hostile intentions and will depart immediately. We sincerely apologize for any offense caused. Hold on, Bayakuya interrupted, stroking his chin thoughtfully. Weren't the ninja we just subdued affiliated with the Grass Village? He glanced at Conan beside him, who mirrored his look of confusion. The tense atmosphere began to dissipate slightly, and Kakashi seized the opportunity to elaborate. The ninja you just defeated were actually Iwagakure forces masquerading as Grass Nin. Their true objective was to spark a war between the Land of Grass and the Land of Rain, dragging Amigakure into the conflict. Bayakuya's expression hardened. While we can't completely trust your word, I will relay this information to Lord Hanzo. However, how can you ensure this isn't some elaborate Kanoha scheme? Historical accounts passed down through generations tell us of Kanahigakure shinobi waging war on our rain soil. Kakashi was momentarily struck speechless. He too was familiar with the events of the Second Great Ninja War, where the legendary Sanin supposedly suffered defeat at the hands of Hanzo of the Salamander on the very land they now stood upon, a feat that earned them their renowned title. Even in his absence for several years, Amige Cure's formidable leader still held considerable sway over the surrounding nations. A misunderstanding that painted Kanoha in a negative light and strained relations with Amige Cure was an unwelcome prospect. Sensing the ease tension, Bayakuya let out a curt scoff and proposed a solution. Considering your current state, infiltrating the land of rain seems beyond your capabilities. Let's call this a truce for now. I'll return and inform Lord Hanzo of the events that transpired here. Be warned, any future trespass into the Land of Rain might result in a personal visit from Lord Hanzo to your Hokage for a pointed conversation. With that, Bayakuya hoisted the IWA Nin's body and, alongside Conan, ventured deeper into the Land of Rain, their figures swiftly swallowed by the dense rainforest. Once Bayakuya and Conan were out of sight, Kakashi, who had maintained a stoic facade throughout the encounter, finally exhaled a breath of relief. His intuition screamed that the blue-haired Kunoichi's strength rivaled his own, and the slightly younger boy by her side emanated a sense of immense danger. It was highly likely that, just like him, they possessed Jounin-level abilities despite being barely more than ten years old. 
In stark contrast to Kakashi's quiet relief, Abito burned with indignation at being sidelined during the entire exchange. Scrambling to his feet, he cast a disgruntled look towards the disappearing figures and grumbled, Why didn't you do anything, Kakashi? Those two reeked of danger. They could be enemies of the village. From Abito's perspective, the boy and girl couldn't be much older than him. Even if they possessed a slight edge in strength over him and Rin, it couldn't be insurmountable. If only Kakashi had been more willing to fight, the three of them together could have trounced those two and taught them a lesson. More importantly, it would have been Abito's moment to shine in front of Rin, a chance to completely outshine Kakashi. Kakashi, however, barely spared Abito a glance. With a dismissive flick of his wrist, he launched a barrage of kanai. The throwing knives found their mark with pinpoint accuracy, detonating the hidden explosive tags scattered throughout the blind spots, sending shockwaves ripping through the forest. Over the cacophony of explosions, Kakashi's voice cut through the air, laced with chilling indifference. Abito, if you have a suicidal urge, feel free to go for it. But don't drag the rest of the team down with you in the process. Abito's face contorted in fury. He planted his hands defiantly on his hips and shot back. Don't get so cocky, Kakashi. Once I awaken my Sharingan, I'll surpass you for sure. You won't be looking down on me anymore then. Kakashi met his outburst with a bored sigh, his focus already shifting to dismantling the remaining traps littering the area. Compared to Abito's childish tantrum, Kakashi's mind was fixated on the young pair they had just encountered. Bayakuya and Konan, despite their young age, held the potential to become formidable adversaries in the near future. Additionally, the mission assigned by their Jounin leader still demanded his full attention. Abito, fuming from being repeatedly disregarded, resembled a cornered, rabid dog, teeth bared and ready to snap. The simmering rage within him threatened to boil over. Sensing the escalating tension, Rin felt compelled to intervene and placate Abito. Her brow furrowed in worry for their team's dynamic. Kakashi's chilling demeanor clashed with Abito's impulsive nature. Couldn't they find a way to work together more effectively? As if summoned by the disharmony, a figure clad in a green jounin vest materialized beside Kakashi and the others with a gust of wind. It was Minato, their leader. With a firm grip, he physically restrained the bickering Abito and Kakashi. Enough, no more arguing, he directed his attention to Abito. Abito, Kakashi's judgment was sound today. Kakashi, he turned to the silver-haired jounin, could you elaborate for Abito? Explain why you didn't engage the enemy. Under Minato's watchful gaze, Kakashi begrudgingly spoke. Abito, I admit I underestimated the situation. The young man and woman we encountered possessed immense strength. Had we initiated a fight, it likely would have ended poorly for us. That strong, huh? Abito fixated not on the apology, but on the rare admission of weakness from Kakashi. Having graduated the Ninja Academy at a mere six years old and recently achieving Jounin status, Kakashi was a prodigy even Abito, consumed by his desire to surpass him, acknowledged would take time to overcome. Bayakuya, on the other hand, looked even younger. A sudden realization dawned on Abito. He pivoted towards Minato. Wait a minute, Sensei. Were you watching us the whole time? I thought. Only a fool wouldn't recognize this as a test, Abito. Kakashi interjected with a disdainful snort, arms crossed defensively. Minato, ever the mediator, sensed the tension rising again. It was a test, yes, but I wouldn't have interfered unless you were in genuine danger. Remember, growth doesn't happen in comfort zones. Thanks to Minato's intervention, the team's atmosphere improved. After securing any spoils from their encounter, they began to move away from the border of the Land of Rain. As they departed, Minato cast a lingering gaze towards the spot where Bayakuya and Conan had vanished. Given their age and evident strength, Bayakuya and Conan were undoubtedly products of Hanzo's elite training program. Were they stationed at the border solely to thwart Iwa's invasion, or was there a deeper motive at play? Minato pondered these questions, but answers remained elusive. Regardless of Hanzo's hidden agenda, Minato was prepared to face whatever challenges arose. After all, including this dismantled base, he had already neutralized five of Iwa's outposts. Eradicating all IWA bases within the Land of Grass could potentially bring an end to the conflict between Kanahagakur and Iwagakur. However, a nagging familiarity pricked at Minato's mind regarding the blue-haired Kunoichi. 
It seemed Jiraiya Sensei had mentioned her before. After a brisk jog that stretched for several dozen minutes, Bayakuya finally conceded to exhaustion and sank down to rest, Conan following suit. Though he hadn't laid eyes on Minato Namikaze, his presence had been an undeniable weight during the encounter with Kakashi's team. That constant, scrutinizing sensation was unnerving, leaving Bayakuya with a chilling premonition of his own mortality. An all-out confrontation with Minato would likely culminate in his swift demise at the hands of the Flying Thunder God technique. This formidable jutsu granted Minato instantaneous teleportation to pre-marked locations. It rendered him untouchable by opponents of his caliber, and escape for lesser-skilled ninja was an impossibility. This very ability had earned him the moniker Yellow Flash. Bayakuya, what troubles you? Conan inquired cautiously, her earlier obliviousness to his disquietude now replaced with concern. Bayakuya recomposed himself, summoning a strained smile. A momentary lapse. He reassured her with a light chuckle. Just the aftereffects of a near miss. We crossed paths with a jounin who wouldn't be out of place vying for the Hokage position. Conan's brow furrowed in confusion. A Hokage caliber jounin? There's no way such a high-ranking individual was amongst them. Perhaps my senses were deceived. Bayakuya hedged, feigning nonchalance. While my perception surpasses that of most, it can be overly sensitive at times. So you do realize you're overly sensitive sometimes? Conan remained silent, a flicker of surprise flitting across her features. Bayakuya's casual admission of his occasional oversensitivity was unexpected, a stark contrast to his usual reserved demeanor. Regaining his composure, Bayakuya started to question his prior excessive caution. Neither he nor Conan were Iwagakure ninja, and their Amigekure headbands were clearly visible. It was unlikely that Minato would risk escalating the situation to war by initiating an attack. After all, popular perception painted Minato as a kind and gentle soul. But this idealistic image quickly dissolved in Bayakuya's mind. Minato's warmth was reserved for Kanahigakure shinobi, not strangers from other villages. To his enemies, Minato Namikaze was a merciless reaper, his reputation forged by countless lives claimed on the battlefield. Bayakuya clung to the belief that Minato had recognized Conan, perhaps due to some connection through Jiraiya. This connection, however tenuous, might explain their peaceful resolution. After all, Minato and Conan could be considered distant siblings, albeit not particularly close. Ultimately, it boiled down to his own limitations. Within the confines of Amigekure, his strength was commendable, enough to neutralize even a special jounin. However, on the grand stage of the ninja world, he was a fledgling. If his power had been significant enough to warrant caution from Minato, he could have exposed the Yellow Flash's presence without consequence. Yet, could this be considered a successful encounter with Minato, emerging unscathed? Bayakuya pondered this. While a physical confrontation never materialized, he reasoned, Sensing Minato's presence and opting for diplomacy demonstrates a measure of strategic thinking and a strong survival instinct. In a sense, it's a minor victory. His gaze drifted towards Conan, who continued to eye him with concern. With a reassuring smile, Bayakuya spoke. Don't fret, Conan Sipai. This experience has yielded valuable knowledge. We've come face to face with the reality of formidable opponents out there. We must push ourselves to become stronger, to safeguard ourselves and our village, Conan offered a curt nod, a hint of confusion lingering in her eyes, but her trust in Bayakuya remained unwavering. Indeed, she concurred. Continued training and growth are paramount. Bayakuya's voice resonated with determination. We will be better prepared next time. We'll continue to evolve, reaching a point where even the most powerful hesitate before crossing our path. Fueled by this newfound resolve, Bayakuya and Conan paused for a short reprieve before continuing their journey. Their hearts burned with an unwavering determination to push their limits, to hone their skills, and face the challenges that lay ahead in the vast and unforgiving ninja world. Regaining his composure, Bayakuya reached for a map, his brow furrowed in self-deprecation. After a half-day detour caused by his earlier wariness, he and Conan had strayed considerably from their intended route. Reaching the black market on the border today, as they had originally planned, seemed out of the question now. Delay was inevitable, pushing their arrival back to sometime tomorrow or the day after. These unforeseen delays weren't entirely without merit, however. 
Not only had they amassed a significant amount of spoils, but they had also crossed paths with pivotal characters in the grand narrative Kakashi and Minato Namikaze. Bayakuya noted with satisfaction that Ibido hadn't awakened his Sharingan yet, indicating the Battle of Kanabi Bridge was still a ways off. This afforded him and the nascent Akatsuki more time to solidify their foundation. More importantly, the innocent Conan by his side, having weathered this recent encounter, would hopefully develop a modicum of caution and shed some of her naivety regarding their adversaries. Lost in contemplation, Bayakuya was startled by Conan leaning in, her voice laced with suspicion. Bayakuya, about the waterproof grease you had on you earlier. How exactly did you know about the weakness of paper release? Bayakuya felt a twitch at the corner of his mouth. He'd thought his earlier actions had fostered some wariness in Conan, but here she was, eyeing him with suspicion. After a calculated pause, Bayakuya spoke slowly, fabricating an explanation. It wasn't difficult to miss your paper shurikens getting damp from the rain. Conan's skepticism remained unconvinced, prompting Bayakuya to elaborate. Of course, the real trump card was that I, too, have mastered the paper release secret technique. Without it, defeating that Awagakure Jonin wouldn't have been so effortless. Conan's eyes widened in disbelief. Paper release was her signature jutsu, unique to her. The notion of someone else mastering it was far more astounding than the mere presence of waterproof grease. Bayakuya, maintaining his facade, offered a curt nod. Back at the base, I would often observe you practicing paper release. It piqued my curiosity, and to my surprise, I managed to grasp your secret technique. Given the urgency of the situation, I didn't dare reveal it until now. Conan's emotions churned within her. Up until today, if she'd discovered Bayakuya secretly learning her paper release technique, she might have grumbled internally but wouldn't have hesitated to teach him properly. After all, they were comrades in arms. But this new reality was far more complex. Bayakuya hadn't simply learned her secret jutsu in secret. He had seemingly surpassed her in its mastery. The question loomed. Who exactly was imitating whom here? The raw shock on Conan's face was undeniable. Bayakuya too felt a pang of unease. He knew pushing the deception this far might backfire, but revealing the truth about the system was out of the question. Among his remaining options, feigning straightforwardness by admitting to learning the technique secretly seemed like the least damaging path. An awkward silence stretched between them as Conan struggled to formulate a response. Finally, she stammered, I... I wasn't aware your paper release skills were so advanced. It seems I have much more work to do. Speaking of, what are your thoughts on the technique itself? Is there potential for further development? Despite his own awkwardness, Bayakuya mirrored her efforts to keep the conversation flowing. I believe imagination is the cornerstone of paper release. With a boundless imagination, one could even envision paper granting the ability to fly. However, within the realm of practical applications, I find the creation of explosive tags to be the most advantageous. Conan's eyes widened. The concept of utilizing paper release for explosive tags had never crossed her mind. Seizing the opportunity, Bayakuya elaborated. Conan Senpai, explosive tags are a formidable weapon on the battlefield. Mastering their creation would grant us a virtually limitless arsenal. Even Kaga-level opponents could be overwhelmed by a relentless barrage of explosions. As Bayakuya expounded on the virtues of explosive tags, a spark ignited in Conan's eyes. This novel application of her signature jutsu resonated deeply. While the explosive power was undeniable, a nagging concern surfaced in the back of her mind. Reliance solely on explosive tags for offense would severely limit versatility and control, potentially leading to collateral damage, a stark contrast to Yahiko's pacifistic ideals. A shiver ran down Conan's spine at the thought. Yet, the logic behind mass-produced explosive tags was undeniable. Enhanced offensive capabilities translated to defeating stronger enemies, ultimately expediting the realization of Akatsuki's goals. Additionally, whispers within the organization regarding Bayakuya's origins fueled a flicker of suspicion. Could Bayakuya be deliberately manipulating her towards developing destructive jutsus? subtly pushing her away from Yahiko's vision and towards a path of bloodshed? The very thought was terrifying, yet the logic of the explosive tags remained irrefutable. With this newfound power, she could overcome formidable foes. Akatsuki's ideals could be achieved with far greater ease. Furthermore, 
Conan recalled snippets of instruction from Jiraiya Sensei pertaining to explosive tag creation. Mastering the technique wouldn't be an insurmountable hurdle. System prompt. Akatsuki has added an elite jonin. Reward. Explosive tag creation method A satisfied smile crept across Bayakuya's face upon hearing the system's chime. By subtly guiding Conan towards a jutsu she would inevitably master in the future, he had significantly bolstered her current strength, propelling her from a capable jonin to an elite one. At this rate, achieving Kage-level power before adulthood wasn't out of the realm of possibility. With Conan wielding Kage-level power, Bayakuya's own influence within Akatsuki would undoubtedly soar. A formidable duo they would make. After verifying they were untracked, Bayakuya and Conan wasted no time, resuming their hurried journey. Their exchange regarding paper release concluded with a tacit understanding. The lingering suspicion about Bayakuya's clandestine acquisition of the technique was left unspoken. As comrades forged in the crucible of a recent skirmish, dwelling on such matters seemed trivial. As they pressed towards the border town, Bayakuya couldn't help but notice a stark decline in the number of travelers compared to the previous day. Whether these missing souls were wandering ninja or disguised military personnel remained unclear. The brutal reality of war, however, was undeniable. The supposed rule safeguarding civilians often evaporated in the heat of conflict. Even collateral damage from ninja battles, with its devastating toll on civilian homes, inflicted unbearable hardship. Ordinary people were left with no choice but to flee with their families, desperately seeking refuge from the war's wrath. Bayakuya, a witness to countless such tragedies in his time here, harbored a deep-seated disagreement with Yahiko's ideals for precisely this reason. Approaching the border town, a vague sense of unease settled over Bayakuya. His premonition soon morphed into a harsh reality. Their intended destination lay in ruins, a desolate wasteland patrolled by a smattering of hidden village ninjas and the unfortunate civilians who hadn't managed to escape in time. The town's destruction inevitably meant the black market, which thrived on its existence, had vanished as well. Their procurement mission had reached a dead end. To secure the necessary supplies, they were forced to explore new avenues. Conan Senpai, Bayakuya addressed her, acknowledging his role as her escort, where do we proceed from here? Confronting the devastation before her, Conan mirrored Bayakuya's uncertainty. I'm at a loss. This was the only black market in the land of rain. There's nowhere else to acquire the medicine and weapons we need. The sole black market within the land of rain? A hint of surprise flickered across Bayakuya's face. Black markets, by their very nature, operated in the shadows. In a secluded country like the land of rain, steeped in isolationism, rebuilding one would likely be a protracted process. However, as his gaze swept across the sprawling grasslands in the distance, a novel idea sparked within him. Conan Senpai, have you considered venturing beyond the land of rain? Perhaps other countries might have what we seek. Exploring beyond the land of rain? Conan echoed, a note of apprehension creeping into her voice. After a moment of deliberation, she offered a hesitant nod. Though the prospect of venturing into uncharted territory was daunting, the dwindling resources within Akatsuki outweighed her fear. The well-being of her comrades, their lack of basic necessities like food and clothing, resonated more deeply than the potential dangers that lurked beyond their borders. Bayakuya, perceptive of Conan's unease, offered a reassuring smile, albeit somewhat helpless. According to the system's evaluation, Conan, despite the soft-heartedness debuff, hindering her full potential, possessed the strength of an elite jonin. This placed her among the top ninja within their rank. Yet, it was precisely this unwavering spirit, this willingness to face the unknown for the sake of others, that initially drew Bayakuya to the fledgling Akatsuki. As they ventured out of the land of rain, a palpable shift in the atmosphere greeted them. The perpetual drizzle that characterized their homeland gave way to sunnier skies and a gentle breeze. The land of grass, in stark contrast, boasted sprawling grasslands and vibrant forests, a landscape teeming with life. Were it not for the presence of formidable creatures and the delicate balance of power between major nations, this land would have likely been devoured long ago, leaving even smaller countries like the land of tea scrambling for scrap. Maintaining a low profile, Bayakuya and Conan weaved their way through the land of grass, discreetly inquiring about the whereabouts of a black market. They soon discovered the harsh reality. 
the battles between Iwagakure and Kanahagakure had taken their toll. Black markets were either obliterated or under strict military control. Weaponry and medicine were subject to even tighter regulations than what they had experienced in the Land of Rain. However, amidst the destruction, an unexpected opportunity arose. The black market for scavenged goods thrived. The bodies of fallen ninja became grim treasure troves, yielding a motley collection of useful items and jutsu. While these scavenged supplies were a far cry from the comprehensive solution they desperately needed, they were better than nothing. Days bled into weeks as Bayakuya and Conan traversed the land of grass, eventually arriving at the doorstep of Kuzagakir village. Unlike other ninja villages, which resembled heavily fortified military towns teeming with tens of thousands of inhabitants, Kuzagakir presented a stark contrast. It was a true village in every sense of the word, its permanent population hovering around a meager 10,000, with only a few hundred actively practicing ninja. Kuzagakir lacked the sheer scale and might of the major nations. During peaceful times, they relied on a steady stream of cheap missions and tolls to keep their heads above water. Wartime, however, found them powerless, forced to surrender their land as a battleground for the larger powers, their village swaying like a blade of grass in the wind, offering a temporary refuge at best. Donning the guise of merchants, Conan cast a doubtful glance towards Bayakuya. Bayakuya, is it truly possible to procure supplies here? Bayakuya, though harboring his own reservations, projected an air of confidence. We'll have a clearer picture upon reaching the market. If they have the audacity to keep the village operational during wartime, there's bound to be some stock available within Kuzagakir. Conan offered a skeptical nod, and they ventured into the marketplace, cloaked in their merchant personas. Bayakuya's eyes immediately darted towards the numerous grass shinobi stationed around the perimeter. It was evident, this market enjoyed the tacit approval of Kuzagakir's leadership. The wares on display were enough to raise an eyebrow. Beyond the usual shuriken and kunai, vendors even dared to peddle ninja scrolls. Granted, these were low-level techniques, but their open sale during wartime spoke volumes about Kuzagakir's brazenness. Their inquiries with various merchants yielded information on acquiring supplies, but the exorbitant prices elicited a grimace from Conan. Her meager funds wouldn't stretch far enough to secure what they desperately needed. Bayakuya, sensing her plight, reached into his backpack and produced a weighty purse, extending it towards Conan. Don't fret. This is the profit I earned from selling explosive tags. Conan Senpai, you yourself possess the knowledge to create them, yet the notion of selling them for profit seems to have eluded you. Exploding tags are a valuable commodity in the current climate of the ninja world. Even though I was the one who first grasped the art of crafting exploding tags, Conan's face remained impassive, yet the substantial purse instilled a sense of insecurity. Before Conan could voice a response, Bayakuya deftly put some distance between them, disappearing into the throngs of the marketplace. He left behind a note scrawled in black ink, Conan Senpai, I'm merely stepping out for some fresh air. We'll meet at the inn later. Conan crumpled the note after reading it, a hint of relief softening her usually cold demeanor. With Conan out of the picture, Bayakuya wandered the streets of Kuzagakir, his motives twofold. Haggling with merchants held no appeal, and a more pressing matter occupied his thoughts, seeking suitable prey. Of course, launching a killing spree within Kuzagakir was out of the question, unless he possessed Hanzo's formidable strength. He also harbored a distaste for resorting to violence as a problem-solving mechanism. Mental manipulation held a greater allure for him, though sometimes brute force proved more efficient. Lost in his brooding, Bayakuya actively approached groups of grass shinobi, hoping to glean valuable intel from their conversations. More precisely, Bayakuya sought information on the Uzumaki clan. His memories from his past life contain details about Karen Uzumaki, a kunoichi who hailed from Kuzagakir and possessed exceptional talent. With proper guidance, she could blossom into an elite jonin at the very least. In this current reality, while Karen herself wouldn't be born for some time, her mother might already be residing in Kuzagakir. Locating her would allow Bayakuya to recruit a future prodigy for Akatsuki, netting him another reward from the system. After all, with the vastness of the ninja world, there was no pressing need to be in Kuzagakir with Conan. Several hours of investigation yielded no fruit. 
The grass ninja he interacted with were either too low-ranking or their knowledge didn't extend to Karen's mother's arrival in Kuzagakir. The only Uzumaki he'd heard mentioned was Minato Namike's future wife, Kushina Uzumaki, and she belonged to Kanahagakur. As night fell, Bayakuya met Conan at the inn. Her elation was unmistakable. Their procurement mission had been a success. They'd managed to secure enough weapons and medicine for Akatsuki. Bayakuya, Conan began, her voice brimming with excitement. Here's the remaining 200,000 Rio from the million you gave me. I'll find a way to reimburse you for what I spent. The weapon prices were triple the usual rate, but medicine remained fairly stable. So, I decided to get some extra supplies, just to be safe. Conan explained, a rare cheerfulness coloring her tone, leaving Bayakuya momentarily surprised. However, the minimal increase in medicine prices, compared to the exorbitant weapon costs, furrowed his brow. Weapon prices have skyrocketed, yet medicine hasn't seen much change. Why the discrepancy? He muttered to himself. Conan, catching his murmur, mirrored his contemplative frown. After a thoughtful pause, Bayakuya turned to Conan, his expression serious. Conan Senpai, draft a message to Yahiko immediately. Inform him that the supplies will be delivered to the border of Amigecure. We'll have someone from the organization collect them there. It seems we'll need to extend our stay in Kuzagakure for a while. Conan offered a gentle nod. Though she lacked full comprehension of the situation, Bayakuya's grave demeanor compelled her to comply. A few days later, within the hidden base of the Akatsuki organization, Yahiko, the leader of the Akatsuki, finished his assigned tasks and turned his attention to the two letters resting on the table. Recognizing the handwriting, he identified one as Conan's and the other from Bayakuya. Conan's letter provided a detailed account of her and Bayakuya's experiences over the past few days. She recounted encountering Leaf Shinobi attempting to eradicate an Awagakure hideout, as well as Rock Shinobi disguised as Grass Shinobi, who were attempting to incite war through border skirmishes. Reassuringly, Conan concluded the letter by stating there was no need to worry about supply shortages. While the war had driven up the cost of materials the Akatsuki needed, she had discovered a new source of income, ensuring the organization's financial stability for the foreseeable future. Bayakuya's letter, however, struck a far more critical tone. Not only did it contain scathing sarcasm towards the Akatsuki's current ideology, but it also indirectly accused Yahiko of being an inadequate leader. He also mentioned Nagato, suggesting Yahiko send for him as backup if urgent matters arose. Yahiko finished reading the letters, a frown creasing his brow as he gazed out the window at the gloomy sky. Bayakuya might have a tendency to exaggerate, but Conan wouldn't fabricate such details. This meant that other ninja villages were indeed intent on dragging the Land of Rain into the brutal conflict engulfing the ninja world. With Lord Hanzo at the helm, the Land of Rain was unlikely to suffer a complete defeat. However, the skirmishes at the border posed a significant threat to the nation's civilians. Unfortunately, with the Akatsuki's current capabilities, there was simply no way to effectively counter these attacks. Unlike those they had previously faced within the Land of Rain, these foreign shinobi wouldn't be swayed by mere persuasion. As the Akatsuki organization expands its reach, it will inevitably encounter these foreign shinobi more frequently, potentially escalating into the very conflict Bayakuya warned about. In such a scenario, retaliation would be necessary, but at what cost? The path of vengeance would undoubtedly erode the ideals of mutual understanding that formed the Akatsuki's foundation, sowing the seeds for a future steeped in hatred and perpetual strife. Despite these looming anxieties, Yahiko remained resolute in his convictions. He wouldn't be swayed. The cold rain lashed against Yahiko's face, momentarily pulling him from his contemplative state. He refocused on Bayakuya's letter, particularly the request for assistance. With a wave of his hand, he summoned someone from afar. Moments later, Nagato materialized before him. This young man with fiery red hair and an innocent expression was, in Yahiko's eyes, the most crucial member of their trio. Yahiko, did you call for me? Nagato inquired. His head bowed respectfully. Yahiko responded with a nod. There's a situation with Conan and Bayakuya. They require your support? A flicker of anxiety crossed Nagato's face as he raised his head, revealing his unique pale lavender eyes. Yahiko, is everything all right with Conan and the others? Rest assured, Yahiko reassured him. 
They're unharmed and have secured vital supplies for the organization. While they could return on their own, Bayakuya specifically requested your assistance. Nagato acknowledged this with a curt nod. I understand. I'll depart immediately. Where is their current location? Yahiko retrieved a map from his desk, marked the location for Nagato, and cautioned him. They're currently stationed in the Hidden Grass Village. However, exercise extreme caution while traveling alone. Many covet your extraordinary eyes. Nagato, who rarely displayed emotions, offered a faint smile. Yahiko, you underestimate my strength. No one within the Akatsuki surpasses me. There's no need to fret. Indeed, Yahiko concurred. Jiraiya-sensei spoke of you as the child of prophecy. With the power of the Rinnegan at your disposal, you possess the potential to one day reshape the world. He then shifted the conversation, finally voicing his underlying thoughts. But Nagato, have you ever considered assuming the leadership of the Akatsuki? You possess qualities that make you far more suited for this role than I am. After establishing the Akatsuki organization, Yahiko had persistently urged Nagato to assume leadership. Despite Nagato's consistent refusals, Yahiko remained steadfast in his belief that Nagato, with his Rinnegan, held the key to realizing the Akatsuki's ideals. Nagato's solemn gaze met Yahiko's as he spoke. I'm not suited to lead the Akatsuki. In my heart, you will always be the true leader, Yahiko. Yahiko's heart weighed heavily with the burden of leadership he felt incapable of bearing. He responded with a light sigh, if you're unwilling, Nagato, then so be it. However, Bayakuya has his sights set on leadership. The position I've reserved for you may fall into his hands someday. He continued, his voice laced with a subtle threat, go assist Bayakuya and Conan in the hidden grass village. Rejecting my offer will inevitably lead to regret. Nagato felt a wave of relief wash over him. The prospect of leading the Akatsuki filled him with dread. As for the leadership falling into someone else's hands, that depended solely on Yahiko's own choices. Nagato's sole desire was to follow Yahiko, to work side by side in their pursuit of world peace. Truth be told, the success of their dream held little weight for him. As long as this life, this companionship, persisted, it was enough. After the loss of his parents and Jiraiya's departure, the Akatsuki was the only family he had left. Nagato departed the Akatsuki base, his form receding as he crossed the border of the Land of Rain. From the concealing shadows, white Zetsu materialized from the earth. His gaze fixed on Nagato's figure shrinking into a distant black dot. With a hurried movement, white Zetsu burrowed back underground, weaving through the soil towards the Land of Grass. He soon arrived within a hidden cavern deep beneath the grassy plains. A colossal statue dominated the cavern's interior, while in the foreground, a wizened figure with flowing white hair sat upon a chair, his eyes peacefully closed. White Zetsu approached cautiously and spoke in a hushed tone, Lord Madara, Nagato has crossed the border and is currently within the land of grass, near your location. Madara Uchiha's eyes snapped open at the news. What prompted Nagato's departure from the land of rain? It appears he's on a mission, White Zetsu explained. During your slumber, Nagato has become affiliated with a group called the Akatsuki. They actively recruit within the Land of Rain, promoting peace through mutual understanding amongst the ninja nations. A flicker of a memory danced in Madara's eyes, his expression turning distant. A cold chuckle escaped his lip. Peace through understanding, HM? There once was a naive fool with similar ideals, but ultimately, he was betrayed by his own comrades. Let Nagato experience the full weight of betrayal firsthand, Madara declared, his voice hardening. The sting of such a wound will surely push him towards our cause. Compared to the absolute power of the Rinnegan, any belief system, no matter how cherished, proves fragile and ultimately meaningless. Kyuzagakir, Bayakuya had spent his days since sending the letters gathering intel. He used a combination of financial pressure and veiled threats to get what he needed. Within half a month, Kyuzagakir's higher-ups brought in a red-haired woman named Karen and locked her away in a secret room. Rumors swirled that Karen possessed a unique ability. Putting the pieces together, Bayakuya confirmed Karen was most definitely Karen's mother. He tried to reach Karen, but the security around her secret room was tight. A rescue attempt would be loud, potentially escalating to a full-blown siege of Kyuzagakir. Since inheriting the Uzumaki bloodline and mastering the art of crafting explosive tags, 
Byakuya's power had undeniably reached Jonin level. With careful planning, even eliminating elite Jonin through covert means wasn't out of the question. However, the risk still outweighed the reward. Waiting for Nagato's arrival seemed like the smarter move. Besides, rescuing Karen alone wouldn't justify this entire Kuzugakure trip. The Akatsuki needed various resources stockpiled here. As his thoughts drifted away, Bayakuya stole a glance at Conan, diligently working on explosive tags to make ends meet. His mind buzzed with the challenge of formulating a well-rounded plan. He began pondering how to formulate a comprehensive plan. A few days after sending his message, Bayakuya met Nagato just outside Kuzugakure. This young Nagato was a far cry from the mastermind Bayakuya remembered from his past life. Gone was the aura of a hidden puppet master. Instead, Nagato appeared as a nervous young man, even avoiding eye contact. Despite his seemingly timid demeanor, this unassuming youth possessed the legendary Rinnegan. While Bayakuya studied Nagato, the young man was doing the same. Bayakuya's clean appearance contrasted with a gaze that felt oddly aggressive towards him, almost covetous of the Rinnegan. Yet, a strange intuition told Nagato there was no real malice behind Bayakuya's stare. Recalling Yahiko's positive assessment of Bayakuya, Nagato released a breath, he hadn't realized, he was holding and spoke. Yahiko sent me to assist you. Please tell me what needs to be done. Bayakuya offered a curt nod and led Nagato to their temporary base. Inside, Conan continued her work on explosive tags, her head snapping up as she noticed Nagato. She rose quickly, and a moment of mutual confusion passed between them before they both looked towards Bayakuya. Bayakuya, Nagato's here too. Can you finally explain the mission? Conan asked, voicing their shared curiosity. Bayakuya surprised them both by not immediately answering. Instead, he turned to Conan. Conan Senpai, it's been a week since we arrived in Kuzugakure. What are your thoughts on this village? Conan furrowed her brow, considering the question. Kuzugakure seems very peaceful. Even though the land of grass is embroiled in war, there's a sense of calm within the village walls. The outside world's turmoil doesn't seem to reach them here, and their villagers and shinobi seem to coexist peacefully, something the land of rain can only dream of achieving. Bayakuya offered a small nod of agreement before turning his attention to Nagato. What about you, Nagato-senpai? Nagato hesitated for a moment before responding. I agree with Conan. Kuzugakure seems like a nice place, I wish the land of rain could achieve such peace someday. However, on my journey here, I saw firsthand the suffering of the villagers along the way. With their responses gathered, Bayakuya remained silent for a moment longer. Then, with a simple wave, he darted out the window, disappearing into the night. His destination, the room where Karen was being held prisoner, crouched in the inky shadows, Bayakuya pointed towards the distant room and unveiled their mission. Conan Senpai, Nagato Senpai, our objective is to liberate a young woman named Karen and convince her to join our organization. Conan's eyebrows shot up in surprise. Recruiting new members wasn't something Bayakuya had ever shown much interest in for Akatsuki. What had caused this sudden shift? Nagato, however, wasn't as phased. He bypassed the question entirely and focused on the task at hand. Can you describe Karen's appearance? Hair color, perhaps? Her hair is a fiery red, Bayakuya explained, and she possesses a unique ability. Her body heals remarkably fast, even from severe injuries. A valuable asset, wouldn't you agree? Nagato and Conan exchanged a hesitant glance. These characteristics, the vibrant red hair, the expedited healing bore an uncanny resemblance to Nagato himself. Could Karen be somehow related? Yup, Karen is a blood relative of Nagato-senpai, a survivor of the Uzumaki clan after their tragic demise. Bayakuya confirmed with a hint of finality, dispelling any lingering doubts. Bayakuya's revelation struck Nagato speechless. Memories of his parents flooded back, a painful reminder of his past. He vaguely recalled his mother mentioning the now-extinct land of Uzumaki during his childhood. Shaking off the wave of nostalgia, Nagato focused on the mission. Bayakuya, what's the plan? Bayakuya responded with a curt nod and unfurled a detailed map of Kuzugakure. I've strategically placed several shadow clones throughout the village. At the stroke of midnight, they'll create a diversion, giving us the window we need to extract Karen. Conan and Nagato couldn't help but feel a knot of unease tighten in their stomachs. 
While Bayakuya's plan was refreshingly straightforward, its success hinged on their ability to overpower the guards stationed around Karen's cell. With at least 10 shinobi patrolling the area, including jonin-level fighters, the odds were stacked against their small team. Furthermore, the potential for failure loomed large. If their operation went south and their identities as rain shinobi were exposed, it could spark a full-blown war between the Land of Grass and the Land of Rain, a conflict none of them desired Bayakuya watched the hesitant pair, a hint of frustration flickering in his gaze. Konan-senpai, Nagato-senpai, are you underestimating yourselves? You're both exceptional jonin, and we have the unparalleled power of the Rinnegan on our side. Nagato shook his head, his voice firm. Yahiko strictly forbade me from using the Rinnegan. If its existence is revealed, it would bring immense trouble to the Akatsuki. Then kill any potential witnesses, Bayakuya countered, his tone devoid of emotion. Silence ensures the Rinnegan remains a secret. Nagato's eyes widened. Now he understood Yahiko's apprehension towards Bayakuya's extreme methods. A soft chuckle escaped Bayakuya's lip. Of course, a merciless slaughter is impractical. However, Nagato-senpai, possessing the Rinnegan, the day will come when you'll be forced to use its power. Wouldn't it be wiser to take control of the situation and avoid a scenario where something even more valuable is lost? Bayakuya's words carried a deep meaning, leaving Nagato contemplative. After a moment's reflection, a realization dawned on him. Bayakuya was subtly pushing him towards using the Rinnegan's power, wasn't he? I understand. I will utilize the Rinnegan when the situation demands it. Nagato finally spoke, his voice resolute. Midnight finally arrived, cloaking the village in an inky darkness. After hours of tense anticipation, Nagato reached up and removed his goggles, revealing the Rinnegan for the first time. Throughout their journey from the Land of Rain, Nagato had meticulously disguised his eyes, even altering his hair color with dye to avoid attracting unwanted attention. Even Bayakuya, ever composed, couldn't help but feel a jolt of awe as the Rinnegan was unveiled. These were the legendary Rinnegan eyes, harboring techniques that rivaled forbidden jutsu. It was a power that could propel one into the realm of the Six Paths, a power few could resist. Bayakuya was no exception, the temptation washing over him in a powerful wave. However, logic quickly reigned in his emotions. He understood that acquiring the Rinnegan wouldn't be a simple feat for one, the eyes currently belonged to Madara Uchiha, who was still very much alive. Attempting to steal them would undoubtedly draw the wrath of this infamous warlord. Secondly, wielding the Rinnegan came at a cost. Transplanting them required immense vitality, either a complete Senju lineage or extensive body modifications utilizing Hashirama's cells. Without such a foundation, the body would be ravaged by the power coursing through it. But Bayakuya wasn't like most. He possessed half of the Uzumaki bloodline, which shared a distant connection to Nagato through his lineage. Perhaps, by aiding Nagato in mastering his power, Bayakuya himself could unlock abilities related to the Rinnegan. Nagato, on the other hand, was accustomed to Bayakuya's intense gaze. Even Jiraiya, their esteemed teacher, wouldn't have been able to look away from the legendary Rinnegan. After all, the last known wielder of these eyes was the revered Sage of Six Paths, a figure shrouded in myth and legend. Since both Nagato and Bayakuya shared the Uzumaki bloodline, they boasted exceptionally keen senses. Their infiltration proceeded without a hitch. They effortlessly reached a spot near the secret room within the building, crouching in the shadows to listen intently to the conversation between Kuzagakir Shinobi. Why bring back this red-headed woman from up north? The village doesn't need a Jinchuriki, and if Leaf Village gets wind of this, it could brew unnecessary trouble, one shinobi grumbled. The alliance between Kanahagakur and the land of Yuzushugakur crumbled decades ago, and this woman holds immense value, another countered. Her blood can act as a substitute in medical ninjutsu with minimal side effect. As long as we draw from her regularly, we can fetch a hefty price for it on the black market, a third explained. Wouldn't frequent bloodletting harm her health? A voice raised a valid concern. Of course it would. That's why those higher up want us to keep her comfortable. But in an emergency, who has the luxury of such concerns? Compared to the exorbitant cost of medical supplies, her blood is a more cost-effective solution, the third shinobi elaborated coldly. Word on the street is they're planning to find someone to fool her into marriage to continue the Uzumaki bloodline, one revealed, a hint of disgust in his voice. 
As long as they can trick her into getting married and having kids, they'll have another useful medical tool in a few years. Another added, the callousness evident. Isn't that a tad too cruel for her? A sliver of doubt crept into one voice. What cruelty? She came seeking refuge on her own, and the village took her in. She owes them for that, otherwise why should the village waste resources protecting a leftover from the Uzumaki clan? The third shinobi scoffed, his words dripping with disdain. The conversation between the Kuzagakure shinobi contorted Conan's face with anger, while Nagato's blood began to boil. Initially, he had harbored doubts about this rescue mission, worried that their intervention might be unnecessary. Perhaps Karen Uzumaki was leading a decent life in Kuzagakure and didn't require their help. Now it seemed he was too naive. Now it seemed his initial optimism had been naive. Bayakuya, with his keen perception, saw right through Nagato's thoughts. In a calm but firm voice, he said, Nagato-senpai, you're not clinging to the fantasy that the shinobi world will ever truly accept Uzumaki ninja, are you? They only see them as tools to be exploited for their bloodline's power until they're spent. Even Kanahagakure isn't innocent. They offered no aid when the land of Yuzushiogakure was under attack. Yet the moment they need a Jinchuriki, they remember the Uzumakis. After all, they possess the ideal physique for sealing a tailed beast. Bayakuya's words struck a chord with Nagato, disarming his earlier optimism. He was right. No village in the shinobi world welcomed Uzumaki ninja anymore. The sole exception seemed to be Bayakuya's own organization, Akatsuki. Their goal, Bayakuya revealed, was to liberate Karen from Kuzagakure's clutches and offer her a place within Akatsuki. Conan, listening intently from the side, couldn't shake off a growing unease. Bayakuya's extensive knowledge about the Uzumaki clan felt suspicious, and a flicker of resentment seemed to color his words when he mentioned Kanoha and Yuzushiogakure. Enough talk, Conan finally interjected, her voice cutting through the tension. When do we make our move? Should you take the lead, Nagato, or perhaps me? Nagato inhaled deeply, his resolve hardening with each breath. He was ready to act whenever the moment came. Bayakuya, however, shook his head, his gaze fixed on the Kuzagakure building in the distance. Leave the rescue to you too. I'll stay behind and create a diversion. My true self has other pressing matters to attend to. What kind of matters? Nagato pressed. Bayakuya offered a cryptic smile. For now, it's classified information. Trust me, it won't hinder your mission. With that, Bayakuya's body contorted, transforming into countless white paper sheets that fluttered away, vanishing without a trace. Nagato recognized the Jutsu Conan's signature paper style. Confused, he turned to Conan. Conan, isn't that your technique? How did Bayakuya learn it? Are we infiltrating using this method? Conan remained silent, the heavy silence hanging thick in the air, adding to the unsettling atmosphere. Faced with this strange turn of events, Nagato held his questions back, silently following Conan as they crept closer to their objective. Several minutes crawled by, punctuated only by the unsettling silence. Suddenly, a series of violent explosions erupted in the distance, shattering the quietude. Conan gritted her teeth, a flicker of worry crossing her features. Bayakuya's a prodigy when it comes to paper style, even surpassing my own abilities. Unfortunately, I haven't yet grasped the art of flight using paper. Let him create a diversion, even if it means putting himself at risk. We have a rescue mission to complete, Nagato declared, her voice laced with determination. As if conjured from thin air, dozens of paper sheets materialized around Conan, each emblazoned with explosive seals. With a flick of her wrist, she sent them soaring towards the unsuspecting Kuzagakure shinobi guarding the perimeter. A deafening roar echoed through the air as the explosive seals detonated, engulfing the unsuspecting Kuzagakure shinobi in a fiery inferno. The remaining guards, momentarily stunned by the sudden explosion, were swiftly dispatched by Nagato, who remained concealed within the shadows. Bayakuya's instructions had placed limitations on Nagato's abilities. He rarely utilized the formidable power of his Rinnegan. However, this restraint did not equate to weakness. Even relying solely on the enhanced physical prowess granted by the Uzumaki bloodline, Nagato possessed the raw strength and combat skills of a seasoned jonin. Meanwhile, on the other side of the chaos, Bayakuya, having concluded his diversionary attack with a flourish of exploding paper clones, silently crept towards the heart of Kuzagakure's main building. 
The Kuzagakir forces, deceived by the paper doppelgangers and the thunderous explosions outside their walls, had diverted most of their manpower, including the village leader, to quell the supposed attack. By Akuya, his footsteps barely a whisper, slipped past the distracted leader and entered the main building with an air of chilling calmness. The Uzumaki bloodline coursed through his veins, augmenting his physical prowess. Coupled with a meticulously prepared arsenal of explosive tags, he was confident in his ability to overpower any Kuzagakir ninja below Jonin rank in a one-on-one -on -one encounter. Jonin level opponents? Kuzagakir simply lacked the numbers to boast such elite defenders. In truth, Bayakuya could have orchestrated the rescue with just Conan by his side, eliminating the need for Nagato's assistance. However, the potential for unforeseen complications necessitated a more cautious approach. Facing down hundreds of Kuzagakir shinobi head-on was a fool's errand, even for someone with Bayakuya's formidable skills. A deafening explosion ripped through the air as Bayakuya detonated explosive tags, blasting a hole through the main building's fortified walls. Emerging from the smoke and dust, he found himself in the secret chamber housing Kuzagakir's collection of ninja scrolls. A satisfied smirk played on his lips as his gaze swept across the neatly organized shelves. Kuzagakir, strategically positioned between the major powers, had managed to cultivate a decent level of strength. This hidden chamber served as a testament to that, brimming with scrolls containing techniques meticulously mimicked from the arsenals of various prominent shinobi villages. Securing these imitation jutsu was a key objective of the mission, and a reason Bayakuya had requested Nagato's assistance. He alone couldn't effectively split his focus between rescuing Karen and plundering Kuzagakir's prized collection. Now, with Nagato and Conan creating a diversion, they had bought him valuable time to gather these scrolls. These stolen techniques would prove invaluable to Akatsuki's growth. Bayakuya understood that raw passion wouldn't be enough to fuel Akatsuki's rise. A well-defined system of rewards and punishments was essential for a thriving organization. As the leader, it was his responsibility to plan ahead and establish such a framework. With a silent nod to himself, Bayakuya meticulously packed the stolen scrolls and vanished from the main building, leaving no trace of his intrusion. As Bayakuya finished his mission, ready to leave, he bumped into the leader of Kuzagakir right on the main street. The Kuzagakir leader originally planned to directly help his men fighting the attacker. But halfway there, a thought struck him, what if the enemy targeted the Kuzagakir building itself? With this worry, he quickly turned back with his guard. Spotting Bayakuya with a bulky sack slung over his shoulder, the Kuzagakir leader, flanked by his guards, approached him. His eyes scanned Bayakuya, then the suspicious sack, leading him to believe Bayakuya was a petty thief taking advantage of the chaos. With a frown etched on his face, he barked, Hey there, kid, what's going on? Bayakuya, momentarily caught off guard, quickly plastered a picture of guilt on his face. Lord Kuzakage, there was a huge commotion in the village just now, so I came out to see what was happening. And well, I just happened to run into you. Hearing the title Lord Kuzakage, the leader puffed out his chest in satisfaction and dismissively waved Bayakuya off. Technically, only the leaders of the five great shinobi nations deserved the Kage title, but hey, who wouldn't enjoy a little flattery, right? At least, the address of Lord Kuzakage made him feel important. After Bayakuya disappeared into the crowd, one of the guards hesitantly spoke up, Lord Leader, could that kid be the attacker? The Kuzagakir leader, brimming with misplaced confidence, scoffed, Takemura, don't be ridiculous, that kid's obviously just a petty thief. A little scolding is all he needs. There's no way he could be the ninja who attacked the village. After all, even he, the leader, couldn't find the attacker. So, the chances of this seemingly young kid being the culprit were slim to none. In his mind, the attacker must be at least an elite jonin-level ninja. Probably from Kanoha or Iwagakure, trying to force Kuzagakure to pick a side in their ongoing conflict. However, Kuzagakure wasn't about to fully commit to either side. They were playing the waiting game, ready to support the eventual victor. Just then, a ninja who stayed behind to defend the Kuzagakure building came rushing over, panting. He delivered a report on the situation, and upon hearing that the building had been attacked by a young boy, a light bulb finally flickered on in the Kuzagakure leader's head. He spun around and sprinted back to the street. But the young boy from before was gone, vanished without a trace. 
All that remained was a single note. As the Kuzagakir leader scanned the message, his face drained of all color. What does the note say? A nearby subordinate inquired. The Kuzagakir leader, his voice tight with dawning realization, spoke a single word. Deez. Deez what sir? Deez nuts. Another agonizing moment passed before the leader choked out the final word, his face darkening with the weight of his folly. Yup, a teenager had just given him a giant middle finger and exposed his earlier arrogance for all to see. High up in the mountains overlooking Kuzagakir, a different scene unfolded, with Bayakuya creating a thrilling distraction, Nagato and Conan, along with their companion Karen, managed to slip away from the clutches of Kuzagakir. After successfully shaking off their pursuers and double-checking for any lingering enemies with their sensory jutsu, Nagato and Conan finally reached their designated meeting point. Both of them, however, couldn't shake the lingering aftertaste of fear from the recent battle. While their strength undeniably surpassed that of an average jonin, a crucial element, real combat experience, was sorely lacking. Back in Amige Cure, their opponents were mostly rogue ninjas from the Land of Rain, easily subdued by their sheer overwhelming power. But Kuzagakir proved to be a different beast entirely. Even with their formidable jutsu, the gap between them and their opponents seemed to have shrunk considerably. The relentless Kuzagakir ninjas put up a fierce fight, forcing Nagato and Conan to struggle for every inch of ground. Their hesitation cost them dearly, resulting in injuries, and when a jonin led pursuit team cornered them, they were pushed to the very brink of annihilation. If it hadn't been for Nagato unleashing the devastating Shinra Tensei technique and taking down the Kuzagakir Jonin, they might still be trapped within the village walls. Yet, amidst the haze of fear and adrenaline, a strange sense of growth flickered within them. Conan, once hesitant to unleash her full arsenal, now coldly tossed explosive tags with deadly precision, watching as enemies were consumed in fiery explosions. Nagato, too, had crossed the line, his hands now stained with the blood of several Kuzagakir ninjas taken down with Shinra Tensei. The weight of these actions, whether they were a sign of progress or a descent into darkness, hung heavy in the air. Shaking off the unsettling thoughts, Nagato's focus shifted to Bayakuya, the one who had bravely drawn the enemy's attention, allowing them to escape. He turned to Conan, a hint of worry etched on his face. Conan, Bayakuya hasn't shown up yet. Do you think something might have gone wrong? Conan, her mind flashing back to the brutal efficiency with which Bayakuya dispatched rogue ninjas, offered a reassuring shake of her head. Bayakuya, she knew, was arguably the strongest ninja in their organization, second only to a raging Nagato. If they, battered but not broken, could escape the chaos of Kuzagakir, then Bayakuya, undoubtedly, wouldn't be far behind. For now, blind worry wouldn't help. All they could do was wait patiently for their comrades' return. A figure emerged from the mountain path, striding confidently towards Nagato and Conan. It was Bayakuya, and relief washed over them at the sight of their comrade. Nagato greeted, a hint of lingering concern tinging his voice. Bayakuya, what took you so long? Bayakuya smirked, a hint of mischief in his eyes. He hoisted a hefty sack over his shoulder and tossed it onto the ground with a satisfying thud. Needed a little extra time to gather some intel, he declared, gesturing towards the bulging sack. Nagato's curiosity peaked. What's in the sack? Ninjutsu scrolls and a few interesting trinkets I found in the Kuzagakir office, Bayakuya replied casually, unsealing the sack and revealing a collection of scrolls. He spread them out before Nagato and Conan, his voice laced with a hint of generosity. Take a look. See if there's anything that catches your eye. Nagato and Conan exchanged a bewildered glance. Here they were, moments ago fretting over Bayakuya's well-being, and now he presented them with stolen scrolls, a brazen souvenir from his daring raid on the Kuzagakir headquarters. This latest action solidified their growing apprehension about Bayakuya, echoing Yahiko's earlier concerns. He was, without a doubt, a powerful and skilled ninja, but his methods bordered on reckless extremism. The silence stretched as Nagato and Conan remained hesitant to reach for the scrolls. Bayakuya, misinterpreting their reluctance, sighed dramatically. Fine, suit yourselves, he muttered, scooping the scrolls back into the sack. Don't come crying to me later if you change your mind, though. With that, Bayakuya's attention shifted to Karen, who was scrutinizing the newcomer with equal intensity. 
Karen, her mother lookalike minus the signature glasses, remained cautiously silent. Nagato and Conan had rescued her from a Kusagakya prison, a strange place filled with syringes containing a liquid suspiciously similar to her own blood. The only thing she knew for certain was the red-haired young man, Nagato, shared her Uzumaki heritage. The other two remained a complete mystery. Even Nagato, despite being a fellow Uzumaki, felt vaguely unfamiliar. Dojitsu Kekiai Genkai, the rare bloodline trait, was something she'd never encountered in a clan member before a tense silence followed Karen's lowered head. Bayakuya, interpreting this as a sign of submission, gave a satisfied nod. Her demeanor, hesitant and unsure, suggested an innocence untouched by the harsh realities of the world. The flicker of panic in her eyes when she looked at him solidified this notion. Unlike the obsessive tendencies of her daughter, this Karen seemed more naturally shy. But of course, Bayakuya couldn't completely discount the possibility of a facade. Genuine or not, Karen's fate in the original timeline was a cruel one. Kusagakir would exploit her until they drained her life force after she gave birth. And even her daughter wouldn't escape a similar fate unless a twisted stroke of luck led her to Orochimaru. Bayakuya often pondered the root of Karen's obsessive behavior in the anime. Did prolonged suffering warp her mind? turning her into a textbook case of Stockholm Syndrome with an unhealthy fixation on Sasuke? From a leader's perspective, such unwavering devotion, even to the point of self-destruction, was a valuable asset. Imagine having followers so utterly loyal, so willing to sacrifice everything for the cause, that betrayal wouldn't even be a concern. A dark thought wormed its way into his mind. Could such loyalty be cultivated through cruelty? Perhaps if he released her now, let her experience unimaginable suffering, then offer her a lifeline, a place in the Akatsuki. After all, those who lose all hope often cling desperately to the first sliver of kindness they're shown, forming an unhealthy attachment to their savior. Pushing these disturbing musings aside, Bayakuya extended a hand towards Karen, his voice firm yet laced with an underlying promise of power. I am Bayakuya of the Akatsuki. Welcome. Join us. The invitation to join Akatsuki unfolded with surprising ease. The moment Bayakuya extended his hand, Karen readily agreed. This swift acceptance left him bewildered. Did he possess some unknown charisma, or had he accidentally stumbled upon the ultimate genjutsu, Koto Amatsukami, without even realizing it? A moment's reflection dispelled these notions. Karen likely had limited options. A refugee from the land of whirlpools, she'd finally found a village willing to grant her asylum, only to be whisked away by Bayakuya and his companions. Now, adrift in the harsh world of Shinobi, joining this enigmatic organization seemed like the least perilous path. At the very least, Akatsuki boasted other Uzumaki clan members, hinting at a possible acceptance of those sharing her bloodline. Just as Bayakuya contemplated Karen's motivations, a system notification blared to life in his mind. A system notification. A new Uzumaki ninja has joined the Akatsuki. Reward. Uzumaki bloodline complete. The notification snatched Bayakuya's attention. With a mumbled excuse, he retreated into the woods, seeking a secluded spot. There, he opened the system panel and with a focused click, accepted the reward. Name. Bayakuya age. 12 current affiliated organization. Akatsuki Chakra Nature, Water, Wind, Yang Ninjutsu, Transformation Technique, Basic Kunai Throwing Technique, Wind Release, Great Breakthrough, Water Release, Wild Water Wave, Paper Release, Basic, Explosive Tag Creation Technique, Kekiai Genkai, None, Bloodline, Uzumaki Bloodline Personal Evaluation, Jonin Level, Can Easily Crush Ordinary Ninjas, But Stands Little Chance Against True Powerhouses, The System Panel Greeted. Bayakuya with a familiar layout, except for the bloodline section. The previous inscription, half, had vanished, replaced by the triumphant declaration. Uzumaki bloodline, complete. Now, Bayakuya could finally claim his true heritage. He was an Uzumaki, his lineage granting him the potential to become a Jinchuriki and serve his village with even greater power. With a satisfied click, Bayakuya closed the panel and turned his focus inward. The enhancements coursing through his veins were undeniable. His physical prowess had improved, his movements sharper and more explosive, but the most significant change manifested in his sensory abilities. Previously limited to a mere 300 meters, 
his perception now stretched a staggering kilometer. This range might fluctuate depending on the environment, but for now, it was more than sufficient. He knew his growth wouldn't stop here. The path to becoming a formidable ninja had just taken a monumental leap. Following his sensory sweep, Bayakuya assessed his chakra reserve. To his delight, they had roughly doubled, placing him in a league above even seasoned Jonin. This was a game-changer. A sudden thought struck him, and Bayakuya reached for his forehead protector. The polished metal reflected his face, his familiar black hair framing his features. He was relieved. It seemed the bloodline wouldn't alter his appearance. No unwanted changes like the first Hokage's face sprouting on his chest upon acquiring would release, a horrifying prospect. He wasn't certain Uchiha pervert seeking eternal power through stolen eyes. He was Bayakuya, and he wouldn't trade his identity for anything. Verifying his surroundings with his enhanced senses, Bayakuya confirmed a safe perimeter for several kilometers. With his mission accomplished, he returned to the temporary camp, his mind set on starting a fire and preparing a well-deserved meal. As he settled onto a rock, a persistent gaze caught his attention. Karen, ever since joining their camp, had been stealing glances at him, her eyes filled with a curious intensity. A few inquiries later, Bayakuya pieced together the events that transpired in his absence. Nagato and Conan, in their conversation with Karen, had revealed his role as the mission's architect. They also shed light on Kuzagakir's nefarious plan to exploit her as a breeding tool. The revelation of Kuzagakir's true intentions sent a wave of complex emotions crashing over Karen. She had braced herself for sacrifices to secure her place in the village, but this was a violation she couldn't stomach. Healing the ninjas that she could understand, but becoming a vessel for procreation, birthing children destined to become mere tools like herself, that was an unbearable prospect. In the face of this horrifying revelation, Karen's perception of Bayakuya shifted dramatically. Gratitude bloomed within her. He wasn't just a stranger, but a savior who had pulled her from the clutches of a living nightmare. A newfound sense of kinship bloomed within Karen, a subtle connection forged by shared experiences. Over the following days, Nagato, Conan, and Karen spent their evenings weaving tales of their past. Learning of Nagato and Conan's orphan status created an immediate bond. They were all adrift in a world that had snatched away their families, leaving them with only each other for solace. Bayakuya, however, found amusement, barely suppressing a chuckle, as Nagato attempted to imitate him, declaring that Karen was too naive. This light-hearted moment was broken by Karen's hesitant question, her voice barely a whisper, Bayakuya-senpai, are you alone too, like Conan-senpai and Nagato-senpai? The question struck a nerve, almost an accusation. While he couldn't deny it, Bayakuya possessed no memories of his true origins. The original owner's past remained shrouded in mystery, leaving him an orphan in a world not his own. This realization sparked an idea. He could craft a new identity, a believable backstory that resonated with his comrades. With a somber expression, Bayakuya offered a slow nod. Yes, Karen. I lost my parents when I was very young. All I have are a few books hinting at their ninja past but my memories of them are fragmented at best. Life after their disappearance was a harsh one. The other children ostracized me for being an orphan, and with no parents to care for me, healing from injuries became a lonely struggle. One day, bandits raided our village, and I was offered as a tribute to appease them. In their hideout, weakness was a death sentence. I learned to feign it, to blend in with the shadows, but within those shadows, I discovered the flow of chakra, the path of a ninja. On my first mission, I returned to that bandit hideout and exacted my revenge. Since then, I've been a lone wolf, wandering the land of rain until I joined Akatsuki. His voice trailed off, a melancholic silence settling over the group. As Bayakuya finished his fabricated narrative, Nagato and Conan inched closer, their expressions somber. Compared to Bayakuya's solitary struggle, their own past seemed idyllic. True, they had lost their parents, but they had each other. The years spent under Jiraiya's tutelage, though brief, were filled with warmth and guidance. The darkness Bayakuya had endured, far greater than they could have imagined, shed light on his underlying distrust of nomadic ninja. He wasn't just a warrior. He was a survivor, forever marked by the trials he had faced alone. Karen, too, fell silent after Bayakuya's tale. She'd thought her own life, 
stolen from the land of whirlpools and exploited in Kuzagakir, was marred by hardship. Yet, Bayakuya's experience painted a picture of utter isolation and betrayal. A pang of sympathy, unfamiliar but genuine, bloomed within her. Despite the brutality he'd endured, Bayakuya had clung to life, even offering her a lifeline out of Kuzagakir. This stark contrast between their experiences underscored a key difference. Bayakuya, forged in the crucible of loneliness, had hardened, while Karen, sheltered in her own way, remained naive. Observing the pensive faces around him, Karen's wide-eyed empathy, Nagato and Conan's somber reflection, Bayakuya released a soft sigh. The past is a prologue, we cannot change it, but we can shape our future. Here, within the flames of Akatsuki, we have found a semblance of family, a purpose that transcends individual goals. Yet, let us not lose sight of the harsh realities that bind us. This world offers no solace for the naive. We must be prepared, for the path we tread is fraught with thorns. The next morning, Bayakuya rose with the first rays of dawn. He packed his belongings with practiced efficiency and joined Nagato, Conan, and even Karen, who, adapting quickly to her role, scouted ahead utilizing her keen senses. Walking at the rear of the group, Bayakuya fell into deep contemplation, his mind a whirlwind of strategic plans for the future of Akatsuki. The past night's open sharing had significantly bridged the gap between them. The once awkward silences were replaced by a newfound camaraderie, a testament to the power of shared experiences. Even Karen, the initially reluctant recruit, seemed to be integrating into the group dynamic. His thoughts drifted towards the organization's fate. The original timeline painted a stark picture, Akatsuki's descent from a peaceful entity to a ruthless mercenary group. Yahiko's ideals, once the organization's very foundation, were cast aside in the pursuit of dominance. In its place bloomed a thirst for power, fueled by the acquisition of potent rogue ninja like Sasori and Orochimaru. To finance their ambitions, they delved into the murky waters of the black market, taking on missions that would taint even the most hardened souls, assassinations, political upheavals, and the instigation of wars. That was all in the anime. Bayakuya's current strength positioned him comfortably within the power hierarchy of the Nagato era. As long as he remained by Conan and Nagato's side, he could prevent the tragic fate that befell in the shape of pain. However, a sacrifice on this scale would cripple Akatsuki, leaving them vulnerable and significantly weakened. This demanded a proactive approach. The key, he realized, lay in preventing Akatsuki's annihilation. In the original timeline, Hanzo, the leader of the Hidden Rain Village, held the organization in a casual disregard. Akatsuki lacked the perceived threat to warrant his immediate action. This changed with Danzo's intervention. The shrewd leader of the Root Division, through manipulation and deceit, orchestrated a conflict at the border, exposing Nagato's Rinnegan, a power Danzo coveted. Whispers reached Hanzo, fueled by Danzo's machinations, twisting Akatsuki from a peaceful entity into a dangerous threat. This ultimately led to the fateful confrontation, a meticulously laid trap with Yahiko walking straight into it. Abito, seizing the chaos, manipulated Nagato's grief and anger, sealing his fate as the vessel for pain. The true winner in this bloody game of power was Abito, who rose from the shadows to become the unseen puppeteer pulling Akatsuki's strings. Bayakuya's course of action became clear. Reminders of the past would be crucial, nudging Yahiko away from fatal choices. However, the primary focus had to be strengthening Akatsuki. A powerful Akatsuki, one that could force the Hidden Rain Village to acknowledge its might, would be an organization Hanzo wouldn't dare to underestimate. It would deter him from falling prey to Danzo's manipulations and eliminate the need for a devastating trap. Additionally, a strong Akatsuki wouldn't hesitate to retaliate against any act of aggression, making Hanzo think twice before initiating a conflict. But wielding raw power wasn't the only solution. Akatsuki needed a new form, a platform that instilled trust and legitimacy. Bayakuya envisioned a transformation from a nomadic entity to a recognized ninja village, a beacon within the land of rain. The foundation for this transformation already existed, the stolen scrolls brimming with ninjutsu technique. Upon their return, they would embark on this path, gradually building influence until the entirety of the Land of Rain fell under their control. Akatsuki wouldn't be a rogue organization operating in the shadows. It would be a force for stability, 
a symbol of strength and the rightful ruler of the hidden rain village. Bayakuya's ambitious plans for Akatsuki screeched to a halt as Nagato and the others came to a sudden stop. Intrigued, he approached, only to be met with a sight that sent a jolt through him. There, standing in their path, were two figures he recognized all too well, the young prodigy Kakashi Hitaki and the Uchiha trailing behind him, Abito. The atmosphere crackled with tension. Kakashi, renowned for his genius throughout the ninja world, stood tall, his posture radiating a tense readiness. Beside him, Abito's Sharingan blazed with two crimson tomo, the sight drawing unwanted attention in the open sunlight. The pair, despite their formidable reputations, were clearly under significant pressure. Kakashi's eye patch, a stark reminder of a recent loss, and their overall exhaustion spoke volumes of a grueling battle they had just emerged from. The tension wasn't one-sided. Nagato and Conan, facing an elite duo with a legendary reputation, couldn't help but feel the weight of the situation. It was a standoff between two sides, both weary yet unwilling to back down. Bayakuya, his sharp eyes missing nothing, honed in on Kakashi's missing eye and Abito's Tutomo Sharingan. A frown etched itself onto his face. The timeline was collapsing in on itself. Based on his knowledge, it wasn't long after Abito awakened his Sharingan that the accident that would supposedly claim his life would occur. Soon after, fueled by grief and rage over Rin's death, he would relinquish his Sharingan to Kakashi, setting in motion a chain of events that would see him manipulated by Madara and eventually become a pawn in a larger game. This was not part of the plan. Abito's descent into darkness was a key factor in the future Akatsuki's trajectory. Bayakuya needed him alive, at least for now. Stepping forward, Bayakuya adopted a mask of mild confusion. Kakashi Hitaki, we meet again. It seems you've matured considerably since our last encounter. But tell me, where is your Kunoichi companion? Kakashi's heart hammered against his ribs. Facing Konan and Nagato alone might have offered a sliver of hope for a peaceful resolution, but with Bayakuya in the picture, things were far more precarious. Just that day, his teacher, Minato Namikaze, had revealed Bayakuya's uncanny ability to sense his presence during a previous mission, forcing them to retreat. This time, Minato wasn't here to back them up, leaving them dangerously exposed. Forcing down his rising panic, Kakashi opted for honesty. Rin has been captured by IWA Ninja. Abito and I are on a mission to rescue her. I see. Bayakuya stroked his chin thoughtfully, his expression unreadable. Abito bristled next to Kakashi. He was ready to shove past Bayakuya and his group, hot on the trail of the IWA Ninja holding Rin captive. But a raised hand from Bayakuya halted his impulsive charge. Why are you stopping us? Are you somehow friends with those IWA Nin? Abito's anger flared, his Tutomo Sharingan shimmering menacingly. He seemed on the verge of unleashing a Jinjutsu on Bayakuya right then and there. Sensing the escalation, Bayakuya shook his head dismissively. Relax, I have no intention of hindering your rescue mission. In fact, I was wondering if you might be in need of some assistance. Abito and Kakashi exchanged stunned glances. Even Nagato and Konan couldn't help but stare at Bayakuya, bewildered. Was he seriously attempting to recruit members from Kanahegakur, and not just any members? The future prodigies? You, you want to help us? Abito stammered, a flicker of hope battling with suspicion in his eyes. Right now, any sliver of help in rescuing Rin was a welcome sight. Kakashi, ever the cautious one, wasn't as easily swayed. What's the catch? The hidden rain village doesn't offer assistance for free. His mind raced with possibilities. Was Hanzo, the leader of the Hidden Rain, seeking an alliance with Kanoha? Perhaps he desired leverage through Minato and Fugaku Uchiha, or maybe he aimed to establish connections with high-ranking officials in the Hidden Leaf. Bayakuya's eyes held a hint of amusement. Compensation is customary for taking on a mission, but let's be honest, you're not exactly in a bargaining position, are you? He gestured towards the distant tree line. Based on the residual traces, those IWA ninja have been gone for over an hour. Time isn't exactly on your side. So, what do you say? We need to know what you expect in return, Kakashi pressed, his voice firm. Bayakuya sighed, a theatrical display of exasperation. Look, all I ask is a gesture of goodwill from Kanoha. Nothing extravagant. And perhaps most importantly, consider this a favor for Minato Namikaze. 
The mention of Minato Namikaze sent a jolt through Kakashi. It all clicked into place. Their last encounter with Bayakuya's group had revealed their identities and even Minato's presence hidden in the shadows. This time, Bayakuya not only recognized them but even offered unsolicited help. Normally, Kakashi would have scoffed at such a proposition, especially from a suspicious group like Bayakuya's. However, their current predicament left them with little room for negotiation. Time was ticking and Rin's life hung in the balance. With a heavy heart, Kakashi, as the team leader, accepted Bayakuya's offer. United by a desperate cause, the unlikely alliance set off towards the depths of the forest, a temporary truce masking the underlying tension. As they hurried through the dense foliage, Kakashi finally had a chance to observe Bayakuya's team. He recognized Bayakuya and Konan from their previous encounter, both formidable ninja. But it was Nagato and Karen who piqued his curiosity. Their hair and eye colors bore an uncanny resemblance to someone he knew, a nagging sense of familiarity gnawed at him. This feeling intensified when he observed Nagato's keen sensory abilities. A startling realization dawned on him. Could it be? Weren't those features eerily similar to Minato's wife, Kushina Uzumaki? Was it possible that these two belonged to the Uzumaki clan, just like Minato's wife? It seemed the demigod leader of the Hidden Rain Village had secretly taken in survivors from the land of whirlpools, offering them refuge and a purpose. Abido, on the other hand, remained oblivious to these underlying currents. Driven by a singular focus on rescuing Rin, he viewed anyone offering assistance as an ally, even the enigmatic Bayakuya who barely acknowledged him. Bayakuya, trailing behind the group, remained lost in thought. While encountering Kakashi and Abido near the Canopy Bridge was an unexpected wrinkle, his decision to join their rescue mission was a calculated one. Bayakuya's intervention wasn't about completely changing Abido's fate. He understood the butterfly effect. A small change could ripple outwards, creating unforeseen consequences. His goal was more nuanced. Firstly, he hoped to delay Abido's accidental burial. Bayakuya wasn't sure if Madara planned it or if it was a random event, but delaying it could disrupt Madara's timeline. This bought Bayakuya more time to potentially influence Abido before his descent into darkness. Secondly, there was the question of loyalty. Was Madara's rescue of Abido a premeditated scheme or a spur-of-the-moment decision? By delaying the burial, Bayakuya could observe Madara's actions and gain valuable intel. Anyway, the current Abido was a lot cuter. Abido, fueled by youthful passion and a singular goal, was far less dangerous than the calculating Abido wielding the Kamui technique. Bayakuya saw him as a potential recruit, not a threat to be eliminated. After all, a disgruntled Abido might be more receptive to joining Akatsuki in the future. Half an hour later, the combined team arrived at the Iwagakure hideout. Abido, ever the impulsive one, lunged towards the entrance, but Bayakuya stopped him with a calm hand. Hold on, Uchiha kid, Bayakuya said, his voice betraying none of his inner calculations. Don't be so reckless. We have no idea what awaits us inside traps, ambushes, who knows what. Kakashi echoed Bayakuya's sentiment. The rain ninja captain is right, Abido. You need to control your eagerness, Bayakuya corrected Kakashi. Just call me Bayakuya. Turning to Nagato, he inquired, Can you give us a headcount, Nagato? How many ninja are inside? Nagato closed his eyes, focusing his senses. Three. Two with chakra levels comparable to Kakashi here. The other has very weak chakra, likely your teammate. A slight pause, then Nagato added, There are also traps set up within the cave, but I can't discern their nature. Kakashi narrowed his eyes, but knew this wasn't the time to dwell on Nagato's abilities. The intel was clear. A trap designed specifically for him and Abito. Accepting Bayakuya's help, as risky as it seemed, might have just saved them from a brutal ambush. With the element of surprise still in their favor, Kakashi, the young Jonin, formulated a plan for a swift attack. He and Abito charged into the underground cavern, Bayakuya and his team following close behind. Emerging into the dimly lit cave, they found themselves face to face with two Iwagakure Jonin, Kako and Taisiki. The sight of Abito's Sharingan sent a jolt of excitement through them, a cruel smile spreading across their lips. For Iwagakure, Rin, the Kanahagakure medical nin, was definitely a target. While important, she wasn't as valuable as Kakashi. After all, this young prodigy, 
who became a Jonin at the tender age of 12, was on track to become the next Kanoha White Fan, a prospect that sent shivers down Iwagakura's spine. Abito, though not quite on Kakashi's level, was still a genius Uchiha with a pair of threatening double Tomo Sharingan. Taking out these future elite Jonin now seemed like a smart move. Just as Kako and Taisiki prepared to make their move, Bayakuya and his crew materialized before them. The sight of the Rain Village forehead protectors instantly wiped the smugness off their faces. This wasn't part of the plan. Why were the Rain Ninja interfering in a fight between Kanoha and Iwagakure? Hey, Kako started to speak, but his words were cut short by Kakashi and Abito's sudden attack. Abito tossed a kanai as a distraction, then flew through a series of hand signs. His chest puffed out as a concentrated ball of fire erupted from his mouth. Fire style. Great fireball technique. The inferno slammed into the ground in the distance, illuminating the cavernous space with a flickering orange glow. By the weak light, Kakashi spotted Rin, bound and helpless in the corner. The situation called for a daring rescue, and with the advantage of numbers, it seemed like the best course of action. Taisiki, however, saw right through Kakashi's plan. With the instant body technique, he vanished in a blur, only to reappear directly in front of Kakashi. The short sword in his hand flashed coldly, effectively engaging Kakashi in close combat, successfully pinning him down. Witnessing both Kakashi and Abito struggling, Bayakuya gave a quick signal, prompting Nagato and his team to join the fray. Bayakuya strode calmly towards Rin, stopping beside her. With a flick of his wrist, he used a kunai to sever the ropes binding her. He then peeled away the tape and eye mask that obscured her vision, studying the girl who captivated Abito's heart. Rin's appearance was delicate, radiating the innocent charm of a girl next door. One could easily see why she was Abito's ideal, his pure white moonlight. Bayakuya couldn't believe that such innocent girl would cause Abito to wage a world war. Women sure are something, well, still better excuse than failing in art exam. Regaining her sight, Rin froze for a moment before registering the scene before her. Kakashi and Abito were locked in combat in the distance. Panic surged through her, and she blurted out a warning, Stay back. There are detonating tags underneath me. If I move, they'll explode. But Bayakuya was already scooping her up before she could finish her sentence. In that same instant, the detonating tags beneath Rin detonated with a deafening roar, engulfing both of them in a fiery inferno. Witnessing the explosion, Kakashi and Abito were rooted to the spot in utter shock. Even Nagato and Karen couldn't help but display a flicker of worry on their faces. Only Conan remained impassive. As a master of paper ninjutsu, she was well aware of Bayakuya's escape technique. Kako and Taisiki seized the opportunity to launch an assault. After easily dodging their attacks, they taunted with cruel laughter. The Rain Village Boy and the Kanoha Medic are probably nothing but ash now. Abito's eyes blazed crimson with rage. He activated his Sharingan, ready to unleash a Genjutsu. Kako, however, wasn't interested in giving him the chance. In a flash, he appeared beside Abito and delivered a powerful kick, sending him sprawling. Abito, fueled by grief and vengeance for Rin, struggled to his feet, determined to make them pay. Just then, the smoke and dust from the explosion settled, revealing two figures emerging from the haze unharmed. Bayakuya still held Rin in his arms, carrying her bridal style. Deep underground, Madara Uchiha, his hair as white as snow, scrutinized the unfolding battle through white Setsu's projection. Ever since transplanting the Rinnegan into Nagato, Madara had kept a watchful eye on Kanahigakur, searching for a worthy successor among the Uchiha clan. His goal, a pawn to keep an eye on Nagato and execute the Eye of the Moon plan after his own demise. Years ago, he had identified the kind-hearted Abito Uchiha as a prime candidate. After extensive observation, Madara became convinced Abito was the ideal inheritor of the Madara Uchiha legacy. To pave the way, Madara orchestrated events. A week prior, he manipulated a group of rock ninja, maneuvering Abito into a near-death state. White Zetsu then intervened, rescuing Abito and completing Madara's control. Step by step, he steered Abito towards the path of darkness. However, Madara's plan was now in jeopardy. The unexpected arrival of Bayakuya and his companions threw everything into disarray. Given the current situation, the rock ninja would be swiftly defeated, 
and Abito wouldn't be on the brink of death. Intervention at this point was too risky. Not only would it be too late, but there was a chance of alerting Nagato, the bearer of the Rinnegan, who was also present at the battlefield. While Nagato hadn't yet mastered the Rinnegan like Madara himself, he still possessed some of its formidable power. The most perplexing aspect for Madara was Nagato's presence. Why would Nagato, who was supposed to be stationed in the Rain Country, suddenly appear on the battlefield of Kuzagakir? Frustrated by the unexpected turn of events, Madara summoned White Setsu, his primary source of intel on Nagato's movements. Report, Madara commanded, his voice sharp with urgency. White Setsu materialized beside him, tendrils twitching. Nagato departed Amigekure half a month ago. He's been stationed within Kuzagakure's territory ever since. Apparently, there was a major confrontation there. Nagato is with Bayakuya and Konin of the Akatsuki organization, even rescuing an Uzumaki ninja. Bayakuya? Madara furrowed his brow, a flicker of confusion crossing his face. He pressed for more information. Tell me everything you know about him. White Zetsu relayed the details he'd gathered about Bayakuya. As Madara listened, a sense of realization dawned. It made perfect sense why this name hadn't rung a bell. Aside from Nagato and Uchiha prodigies, ninjas from foreign villages rarely warranted his attention. A mere jonin like Bayakuya simply hadn't been on his radar. However, the details piqued his interest. White Zetsu described how Bayakuya, a teenager no less, had single-handedly infiltrated the Kuzagakure building, throwing the entire village into a frenzy. This feat demanded recognition. Hmm, Madara mused, stroking his chin. If this Bayakuya continues to develop, he might even reach the level of Hanzo the Salamander someday. The legendary leader of the Salamander clan was a formidable opponent, and the prospect of a similar talent emerging intrigued Madara. Madara's eyes gleamed as White Setsu recounted Bayakuya's ruthless treatment of rogue ninjas. It mirrored his own past actions, a time when he, too, believed in eliminating potential threats before they could blossom. A pang of regret shot through him. He'd chosen a destructive path, but now, he walked a different, righteous one. With a newfound interest in the unfolding events, Madara shifted his focus on the projection. No longer solely concerned with Abito's fate, his gaze swept across the entire battlefield. This unexpected turn of events had derailed his plan, but a new opportunity presented itself, a chance to observe these young warriors in combat. Decades spent in hiding had taken their toll. Madara's once formidable body had succumbed to the relentless march of time. His frail state prevented him from directly participating in the fray. Instead, he was forced to rely on White Setsu's projections, a mere shadow of the real battle. The thrill of a true fight, it seemed, would have to wait until his inevitable resurrection. On the other side, Bayakuya's successful rescue of Rin washed away the worry etched on Kakashi and Abito's faces. A collective sigh of relief swept through the group as the tide of tension receded. Now, their focus shifted entirely to the remaining Iwagakure Jonin, Kako and Taisiki. Neutralizing these two would ensure the mission's success. Kako and Taisiki, however, did not share the Kanahagakure team's newfound optimism. As the enemy ninjas approached, their faces drained of color, palms slick with nervous sweat. The dampness creeping down their backs mirrored the despair clouding their eyes. The sheer presence of their opponents overwhelmed them. Witnessing Bayakuya's effortless handling of the detonation talisman had driven home a terrifying truth. These Rain Nin assisting Kanoha were no ordinary chunin. They were, without a doubt, jonin of equal caliber. Manpower stretched thin, escape itself seemed an impossible luxury. Detonation of the hidden talisman, a desperate gamble for survival, loomed as their only option. Exchanging a grim look, Kako and Taisiki gritted their teeth and weaved a series of hand signs in unison. With a synchronized slam of their palms against the ground, they unleashed their jutsu. Earth release. Rock lodging destruction. The earth rumbled with a deep bellow as the jutsu echoed from both Iwagakure Jonin. Smooth cracks snaked across the cave ceiling and floor, growing at an alarming rate. Then, with a terrifying roar, the earth began to crumble. Countless boulders rained down from above, threatening to engulf the entire cave in a deadly avalanche. Panic erupted. Everyone, Kanoha and AIM ninja alike, scrambled for the exit. 
The once orderly mission zone devolved into a scene of utter chaos. The chaos wasn't a shield for everyone. Even amidst the panic, Kako and Taisiki didn't miss their chance. They lunged at Kakashi and Abito, aiming to eliminate Kanoha's prodigies. Additionally, escaping with news of the Rain Kanoha collaboration was paramount for their village. Just as they were about to strike, a detonation tag came flying in from the cave entrance, engulfing Kako and Taisiki in a sudden burst of flame. It was clear Bayakuya had set a trap outside, unwilling to let the rock ninja leave alive. After a tense ten seconds, everyone emerged from the collapsing cave. Gazing upon the dust cloud billowing from the fallen mountain, they couldn't help but sigh. Such a massive landslide wouldn't leave any survivors, not even elite ninja. As the shock subsided, Rin, still cradled in Bayakuya's arms, spoke softly, It's safe now, can you please put me down? Bayakuya complied, gently setting her on the ground. Witnessing this, Abito couldn't mask his envy. He hadn't even gotten a hug yet, and here was someone else holding Rin close. But then again, it was her savior. Anger was pointless, leaving only a pit of jealousy in his stomach. Rin, cheeks flushed, offered a shy smile to Bayakuya. Thank you for everything. I wouldn't be here if not for you. There's no need, Bayakuya replied calmly, brushing dust off his uniform. It was part of the deal we made. However, his voice turned serious. After this near-death experience, I recommend leaving the ninja life behind. Becoming an ordinary person might be the best option for you. Though confused, Rin nodded at her savior's words. I'll give it serious thought. That's when Abito and Kakashi approached Rin. Abito bombarded her with questions about her safety, while Kakashi turned to Bayakuya, his voice laced with gratitude. Captain Bayakuya, words can't express how grateful I am for your help. Bayakuya's lips curved into a smile. If you insist on thanking me, consider joining our organization. As comrades, helping each other would be natural in this way. If you insist on thanking me, why not join our organization? We'd all be comrades then, and helping each other would just be second nature, Bayakuya said, extending his offer. Kakashi, Abito, and Rin were speechless. This invitation to switch sides was outrageous. Forget the fact that defecting was a serious offense. Even if they were considering it, the Land of Rain wouldn't be their destination. Kanahigakur, the very first ninja village, towered over the hidden rain village in every aspect. After a stunned silence, Kakashi spoke, a hint of helplessness in his voice. Captain Bayakuya, you can't be serious. We would never dream of leaving the village. There are people here we can't abandon. But if you ever decide to visit Kanoha, we'd be happy to have you. Abito chimed in, his voice brimming with youthful ambition. By then, maybe I'll even be Hokage. Hokage, huh? And these precious people you can't leave behind. Bayakuya mused, his gaze lingering on Kakashi and the others. Well, I wish you all the best in achieving your dreams. But remember, if things ever go south in Kanoha, my door is always open. I have a soft spot for the lost and lonely. With a final wave, Bayakuya turned and headed back towards the Land of Rain, leaving Kakashi and his team to ponder his bizarre proposition. After they left the neighboring Iwagakure, Nagato voiced his confusion. Bayakuya, why help those Kanoha ninja? They aren't exactly our comrades. For an ordinary person in need, Nagato wouldn't hesitate to lend a hand. But when it came to ninja skirmishes, especially involving Kanoha, Nagato faltered. Kanoha ninja were responsible for his parents' deaths, the very reason he ended up in the orphanage. Yet, Jiraiya, who offered him warmth like a father figure, also hailed from Kanoha. Even with his newfound allegiance to Yahiko's ideals, Nagato could only manage indifference towards Kanoha ninja at best. Bayakuya offered a cryptic explanation, their identities, of course. Kakashi and Abito are students of Minato Namikaze, a senior Kanoha ninja, and Minato's teacher is Jiraiya. He is one of the three legendary Sanin. Helping them this time wouldn't be a bad investment if it gets us closer to Jiraiya. Nagato and Konan exchanged a peculiar look after hearing Bayakuya's reasoning. They desperately wanted to tell him the big shot he was referring to was their own sensei for three years, and even the birth of Akatsuki was linked to Jiraiya's ideals. However, this unexpected encounter established a strange connection between them and Kakashi's team. In terms of hierarchy, they practically became these youngsters' uncles. Bayakuya, noticing their peculiar expressions, realized he'd bungled things this time. 
As a reincarnator, he possessed a vast knowledge base, but wielding that information effectively proved to be a constant headache. As Bayakuya's form dwindled into the distance, Kakashi finally allowed himself to relax. He was undeniably grateful for Bayakuya's intervention, but the immense disparity in power had kept him on edge. Every step had been fraught with tension, the constant worry of a misstep that could ignite a conflict gnawing at him. Thankfully, Bayakuya seemed to be jesting with his offer, not forcing their defection. Otherwise, in their weakened state, they would have been forced to feign agreement, navigating the situation with cautious steps. Kakashi let out a weary sigh, his fingers brushing against the covered eye patch, leading Abito and Rin towards the land of fire. His primary focus was finding a place to rest. After hours of travel, they finally reached the familiar site of the Kanoha camp, a haven for weary souls. Rin retrieved the medical kit and tossed bandages to Abito, allowing him to self-tend to his wounds, before turning her attention to Kakashi. A thorough examination led to a heavy sigh escaping her lips. Kakashi, there's a strong possibility you might lose sight in your left eye permanently. It's all my fault. If I hadn't been captured, Kakashi tried to lighten the mood with a feigned nonchalance. Just an eye, he muttered, his gaze flickering towards Abito. No big deal. At least Abito awakened his Sharingan this time. Our team's strength isn't exactly crippled. Besides, he continued, his voice hardening slightly, I don't want to be seen as a scum. In the ninja world those who break the rules and laws are regarded as scum, but those who would abandon even one of their friends are even worse than scum. It was a lesson Kakashi himself had received from Abito. The weight of those words pressed down on Abito, his cheeks flushing a deep scarlet and he wanted to bury his face in bed. Stealing his resolve, Abito blurted out a hasty proposition, it's just one eye. I have this brand new Sharingan right here. Once we get back to the village, I'll transplant it to you. Kakashi, however, remained unfazed. He waved a dismissive hand. Nah, forget it. I don't need your other eye. Even with one eye, I'm still a top-notch ninja in the village. Their familiar bickering, a well-worn rhythm from their childhood days, filled the room. However, Rin, the rescued teammate, couldn't shake off a disquieting feeling. Bayakuya's words echoed in her mind. People like you are not suitable to be ninjas. It is the best choice to live a plain life as an ordinary person. Initially, she dismissed it as a passing comment. But after hearing Kakashi and Abito recount her capture, a seed of doubt sprouted within her. Here she was, surrounded by these exceptional ninja. Kakashi, the prodigy, had sacrificed an eye for her sake. Abito, once the weakest link, had faced down a jonin head-on. In contrast, Rin, the supposed medical support, remained a burden. Throughout their time away from the village, she had been shielded, never forced to take a life, never possessing the courage to even plunge a kunai into an enemy. Lost in contemplation, Rin gazed at her teammates. With a deep breath, she finally spoke. Kakashi, Abito, after everything that's happened, I realize I might not be cut out for this ninja life. When we return to the village, I plan to retire. Abito's jaw dropped. You're quitting? Quitting being a ninja? Disbelief laced his voice as his eyes darted between Rin and Kakashi. Rin offered a small nod. Abito, Kakashi, I'm truly sorry. I can't continue to be a drag on this team. You deserve better teammates, ones who won't hold you back. But Rin, you're not a burden. I was the dead weight before. Abito stammered, his emotions a whirlwind. Saving Rin had brought him joy, and he'd even offered his own eye as a replacement for Kakashi's. Yet, the news of her departure sent him reeling. He didn't know what to say. Kakashi, on the other hand, remained outwardly calm. However, a flicker of uncertainty played across his features. Should he try to dissuade her from leaving? Just then, the door creaked open, revealing a familiar blonde figure. Kakashi, Abito, Rin, Minato apologized sheepishly. I'm so sorry I'm late again. Minato Namikes, a name etched in legend, rising from humble beginnings, he graduated at the top of his class, securing a coveted apprenticeship under Jiraiya, one of the esteemed Sanin. Mastering the awe-inspiring Flying Thunder God technique, he earned the moniker Golden Flash and ultimately ascended to the esteemed position of fourth Hokage. His achievements were undeniable. After his selfless sacrifice to protect Kanahigakur, Minato Namike's son, Naruto Uzumaki, became the prophesied child destined to save the world. 
Golden Flash, Fourth Hokage, father of the prophecy's child, Minato Namikaze would hold many titles. But for Kakashi, Abito, and Rin, he was simply their ever-optimistic teacher, a man with an unfortunate tendency to arrive late at critical moments. Kakashi, Abito, Rin, my apologies for the delay once again, Minato announced as he pushed open the door. The atmosphere in the room was heavy with a seriousness that instantly put him on guard. The three students seemed engrossed in a tense conversation, and Kakashi now sported a new eye patch over his left eye. Teacher Minato, thank goodness you're here. We need your help convincing Rin. She, she wants to quit being a ninja, Abito blurted out. In normal circumstances, he'd definitely voice his frustration about Minato's tardiness, but the gravity of the situation demanded his full attention. Minato's brow furrowed in concern. Rin wants to leave the ninja life? Tell me everything in detail first. He was well aware that quitting wasn't an option during wartime. Even if she submitted a formal request to the third Hokage, it would likely be rejected. Holding on to these feelings of inadequacy would only hinder her performance and put her team at a disadvantage on future missions. Emboldened by Minato's presence, Abito launched into a detailed account of their recent ordeal. He recounted their team's ambush by the IWA ninja, the harrowing rescue of Rin, and their return to Kanoha for recuperation. Minato listened intently, piecing together the events that led to Rin's internal struggle. He understood the root of her desire to leave. It wasn't fear of death that haunted her, but the crushing weight of being a burden to her teammates. This time, her capture had resulted in Kakashi losing his eye. The guilt gnawed at her. What if the next mission ended in tragedy, costing them their lives? The blame, however, rested solely with the enemy who had targeted them, not on Rin herself. Her bravery and unwavering loyalty were beyond question. The question now was, how could Minato help her overcome this emotional hurdle and continue her ninja path with confidence? Minato's brow remained furrowed in deep thought. Finally, he spoke, his voice earnest, Rin, do you recall the three core principles that guide medical ninjutsu? Saving lives, protecting comrades, and unwavering determination. Your actions during this mission embodied each of these principles flawlessly. There's no shame in how you handled the situation. In fact, I believe both Abito and Kakashi would rather have you by their side than any other medical need. If your heart is truly set on retiring, I can submit a formal request for you after the war conclude. But remember, whatever path you choose, your teacher will always support your decision. With those words, Minato left the room, giving Kakashi's team the space they needed to process his guidance. He understood his role had shifted, after all, Kakashi was now a jonin, and Rin and Abito had risen to the rank of Chunin. He was no longer just their leader, but a trusted mentor. The silence stretched after Minato's departure. Finally, Abito burst out, Rin, take some time to think this through carefully. Minato's right, you need to be sure about your decision. Kakashi and I can't imagine this team without you. He reached out, placing a hand on Kakashi's shoulder in a gesture of solidarity. Kakashi, ever stoic, nodded in agreement. Abito's right, Rin. Rin, buoyed by the unwavering support of her teammates, felt a surge of warmth spread through her. Then I'll do as Minato suggested, she declared. I'll wait until we return to the village before making a final decision. But no matter what I choose, you both will always be my most cherished companions. Companions, huh? Abito echoed, a flicker of disappointment crossing his features. He wanted to be more than just companions. On the other side, Minato emerged from his students' quarters, his brow still etched with concern. He sought out his own teacher, Jiraiya, who sat hunched over a cluttered map in the heart of the Kanahigakure Command Center. Jiraiya, entrusted with the critical role of overseeing Kanoha's war effort against Iwagakure, bore a heavy burden. While the Nara clan provided invaluable strategic support, the weight of countless decisions rested solely on his shoulders. A man accustomed to a carefree, nomadic lifestyle, Jiraiya yearned to be on the front lines, battling alongside his comrade. However, his current duty held paramount importance, to contain the threat posed by Iwagakure's two Jinchuriki and prevent a surprise offensive. This meant delegating the task of dismantling Iwagakure's stronghold in the Land of Grass to his most trusted disciple, Minato Namikaze. A weary smile stretched across Jiraiya's face as Minato entered. Minato, your performance was exceptional. 
destroying that stronghold in the land of grass will significantly disrupt Iwagakure's supply lines and threaten their rear flank. It was simply my duty, Minato replied with a faint smile, his voice betraying a hint of worry. Jiraiya, a keen observer of his student, didn't miss the underlying concern. Something troubles you, Minato. Is it your students? Were they injured during their mission? Perhaps I should send someone to check on them. Minato nodded. There was an incident, but I believe they can handle it. Interestingly, they mentioned receiving assistance from several ninjas from Rain Country. Based on their descriptions, they could very well be your former students who have found refuge there. Jiraiya's eyes lit up at this revelation. Tell me everything, he urged. Minato readily shared details about Conan and Nagato, and the mysterious Bayakuya and Uzumaki girl. He emphasized their final encounter, particularly the blue-haired girl wielding paper jutsu and the red-haired boy who strongly resembled Nagato. The girl with blue hair. That must be Conan and the red-haired boy. Nagato? This is truly surprising news. A wave of nostalgia washed over him, transporting him back to the three years he had spent with Yahiko, Conan, and Nagato, a cherished yet bittersweet memory. He couldn't help but wonder about the circumstances that led his former students to join an organization in Rain Country. A thoughtful silence descended upon the room after Minato finished recounting his encounter with his students. Jiraiya finally broke it, his voice laced with a hint of amusement. That Bayakuya fellow. Interesting. Perhaps he sensed the connection between Kakashi and your students, and maybe even you and me. Maybe the invitation to join them was more of a playful nudge than a serious offer. Minato chuckled softly. Thanks to your guidance, teacher. Without your past training, my students might have been in far greater danger. Jiraiya waved his hand dismissively. Nonsense, Minato. Don't credit me with everything. But his playful demeanor vanished, replaced by an air of seriousness. Speaking of the future, Minato, any thoughts on the fourth Hokage position? The third has been hinting at retirement lately. There could be a selection process after this war. Minato let out a short laugh. Rest assured, teacher. I fully intend to participate in the Hokage election. If I can leverage my contributions in this war and earn the respect of the village, I'm confident the third Hokage will consider me. Confidence is key. As your teacher, I'm firmly behind you in this. Though, he added with a mischievous chuckle, if Orochimaru throws his hat in the ring, I suppose I'd have to offer him my congratulations too. Minato, accustomed to his teacher's unpredictable nature, simply smiled faintly. Yet, beneath that smile, a steely resolve burned. The position of fourth Hokage was a prize he was determined to claim. The room was dimly lit, casting long shadows across the cluttered desk. News of Minato Namike's triumphant return sent a frown creasing Danzo Shimura's face. As both an advisor to the Hokage and the leader of Kanoha's clandestine root organization, he should have been celebrating the destruction of Iwagakure's base. This victory tipped the scales of the ongoing war heavily in Kanoha's favor, bringing the promise of a swift conclusion closer. Yet, the thought of Minato receiving all the accolades for this success twisted Danzo's gut with envy. The more recognition Minato garnered, the further Danzo felt from his ultimate goal, the Hokage's hat. This nod at him, fueling a desperate need for a feat that would overshadow Minato's accomplishments and propel him to the forefront of the upcoming Hokage election. But deep down, a nagging doubt persisted. Could Danzo, burdened by his advancing years, truly compete with the youthful and energetic Minato? Was endorsing Orochimaru as the next Hokage his only remaining option? A sigh of frustration escaped Danzo's lips as he reached for a map of the ninja world, his gaze sweeping across the sprawling network of nations. He needed a way to expand the conflict, to draw more countries into the bloody mire of war. Only then could Kanoha's advantage truly flourish, and only then could Danzo achieve feats worthy of Haruzen Saratobi's attention. The Land of Rain emerged as the perfect target. Every move made by Hanzo the Salamander, the demigod who bestowed the title of Sanin upon three legendary shinobi, would reverberate throughout the ninja world, drawing the attention of all the major powers. Danzo Shimura as he pondered his next move. Finally, he spoke, his voice sharp in the oppressive silence. Ryoma, he addressed the ninja beside him. Dispatch a team to the Land of Rain. We need to assess the situation and determine if there's an opportunity to embroil Hanzo in the conflict. Aburame Ryoma, 
his face obscured by the signature Aburane clan glasses, curtsied sharply. Understood, Danza Sama. Then, a flicker of concern crossed his features. Speaking of teams, should we continue monitoring Kakashi's squad? They just returned from a mission, and apparently encountered a Jonin from Iwagakure. Unfortunately, the root squad assigned to follow them was also killed in the process. Ryoma repeated the details of Kakashi's team's return, his voice devoid of emotion. Danzo's expression twitched at this news. He had placed Kakashi's team under surveillance for two key reasons. Firstly, the young prodigy was the son of the disgraced Sakumo Hataki, making him a figure of interest. Secondly, and more importantly, there was Abito Achiha. Despite being an outlier within his clan, Danzo couldn't ignore the potential threat any Achiha posed, especially one under the direct tutelage of Minato Namikaze. If Minato truly ascended to Hokage, Abito's position as his student would be a significant advantage for the young Achiha. A thoughtful frown creased Danzo's face. After a moment's consideration, he spoke, maintain surveillance on their movements. The fact they encountered a Jonin powerful enough to eliminate a root squad and still returned unharmed suggests there might be more to them than meets the eye. Ryoma bowed once more. Yes, Danzo-sama. With that, he melted back into the shadows, leaving Danzo alone with his plotting and his ever-present ambition. After a grueling journey that stretched over a day, Bayakuya and his teammates finally returned to the Akatsuki base. Twenty long days on the road had left him yearning for rest and a chance to unwind the coiled knot of tension in his gut. However, before indulging in any well-deserved relaxation, he had pressing matters to attend to. A meeting with Yahiko, the leader of Akatsuki, was a top priority. They needed to discuss the organization's future and chart a course for its growth. Pushing open the door to the Akatsuki office, Bayakuya found Yahiko engrossed in conversation with Conan, Nagato, and a woman he didn't recognize. Her face bore the faint traces of a recent ordeal, and a flicker of recognition sparked in Bayakuya's memory, Karen, the Uzumaki he'd rescued. Yahiko's gaze softened as he addressed Karen. Welcome to Akatsuki, Karen. Consider this your new home. Given your current condition, frontline missions wouldn't be ideal. How would you feel about a logistics role? Karen hesitated, her voice barely a whisper when she replied, I'll follow Lord Bayakuya's lead. Wherever he needs me, that's where I'll be. Yahiko's expression darkened at this. Following Bayakuya was a recipe for disaster. Reports from Nagato and Conan painted a vivid picture of Bayakuya's reckless raid on the Kuzagakir building to liberate Karen. If not for his mastery of paper release jutsu, the entire operation could have ended in catastrophe. Even with Nagato, the prophesied child of prophecy, in their ranks, such recklessness couldn't be tolerated. Chief Yahiko, Bayakuya's voice loomed from the doorway, effectively cutting through their conversation, if you're looking to recruit new members, perhaps a more discreet approach is warranted. Karen falls under my purview, and I assure you, she's in capable hands. Or perhaps you're looking to poach from my team. In that case, I might just return the favor and extend an invitation to Conan Senpai and Nagato Senpai. Bayakuya's blatant disregard for protocol was evident. Yahiko, seemingly unsurprised by Bayakuya's eavesdropping, sighed deeply. By all means, Bayakuya, those you recruit are your responsibility. However, your recent actions were beyond reckless. They could have ignited a war between nations. Calculated risks often yield significant reward. And I assure you, the items I procured from Kuzagakir will prove invaluable in strengthening our organization. Bayakuya countered. The stolen jutsu scrolls are indeed a boon. But at what cost? What if your mission had failed? What then? Yahiko conceded, a frown creasing his brow. The likelihood of failure was minimal. Besides, how do you propose we maintain the organization's unity without offering tangible benefit? Do you truly believe your idealistic rhetoric is enough? Bayakuya brushed aside Yahiko's concerns. The tension in the room crackled with unspoken hostility. Sensing an imminent clash between Bayakuya and Yahiko, Conan shot a discreet glance at Nagato and Karen, silently urging them to follow her out of the room. After the others left, Yahiko took a deep breath. His gaze, usually bright with youthful idealism, held a newfound seriousness as he locked eyes with Bayakuya. Let's set ideological differences aside for now. Tell me, what truly motivated your recent actions? 
Yahiko couldn't reconcile Bayakuya's recent activities, from black market dealings on the border to the daring rescue in Kusagakure a with mere recklessness. After all, Akatsuki was their shared dream, a dream they'd nurtured through countless discussions. Bayakuya wouldn't jeopardize their fledgling organization on a whim. The future of Akatsuki, Bayakuya replied, his voice grave. The playful smirk was gone, replaced by a grim determination. Even without the advantages of the Kanahagakure ninja system, Bayakuya was resolved to see Akatsuki flourish. Yet, the initial hurdles seemed insurmountable, almost crushing his spirit. Yahiko offered a curt nod, urging him to elaborate. Bayakuya's tone shifted to a conversational one. Think about it, Yahiko. A year has passed since we founded Akatsuki. Our initial vision was to foster peace within the land of rain, then ripple that peace outwards, touching the entire ninja world. But here we are, a year later, and Akatsuki's influence remains confined to a few villages. Sure, our comrades can stomach meager rations and helping civilians pro bono, but how long will their spirits endure a repetitive, seemingly fruitless existence? Yahiko fell into deep silence. Bayakuya's words struck a deep chord, echoing a concern that plagued Yahiko himself. He didn't have a solution, and the uncertainty weighed heavily on his leadership. Finally, Yahiko broke the silence. Do you have a plan to change this, Bayakuya? And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.